Hey there, folks. Welcome to one of our at-home table reads. Tonight we're doing one of the most underappreciated superhero movies of the late 90s, Mystery Men, with the twin star of Ben Stiller, Hank Azaria, and William H. Mace. Tonight, another fun cast of characters bringing us to life. So, for our action description tonight, we have Nicole. Perfect. As our villain is Casanova Frankenstein. We've got Matt. There he is down there. As our big three heroes. Starting off, we have Mr. Furious. Where's Jess at down there? Perfect. The Shoveler. There's George. And now he's playing the Blue Raja, Master of Silverware. Uh, we also have the Invisible Boy. So yeah, perfect. There's Eric. We've got the Spleen. Awesome. Tyler hanging out right up there. We've got the Bowler. Perfect. There's Angie. And, well, the Terribly Mysterious Sphinx. Holly right there. Perfect. There's also... Saving the city. Well, actually, let's start with helping out Casanova Frankenstein and his uh, journey for evil. We have as Dr. Annabelle Lee. Where's Anna? Perfect. And, well, the champion who everyone looks up to in Champion City. You have the man, the myth, the legend, Captain Amazing. Matt hanging out right down there. Awesome. Well, Nicole, take us away. Mystery Men, screenplay by Neil Cuthbert, based on the Dark Horse comic created by Bob Burden, revived June 6, 1997. Theme and credits, Beta in exterior eerie hospital for the criminally insane day. Camera moves through a tangled jungle of razor wire, finally coming into view of a foreboding fortress-like institution surrounded by towers and gun turrets. Screaming and horrible laughter is heard from within close on a sign that reads eerie hospital for the criminally insane. This is where the worst killers and psychos go. Interior conference room continuous. The camera pans the expressionless faces of the review board as Casanova Frankenstein sits across them, dressed in an immaculately tailored prison smock with Casanova exquisitely embroidered above the pocket. He sits um, he sits as Dr. Emmett Bierce, the hospital's fatherly chief of psychiatry, presents his case. No one can deny the horrendous nature of Mr. Frankenstein's crimes, but in the 20 years that he's been with us, I have never seen a patient turn his energies to a more productive use. Casanova, the picture of remorse and repentance. Just look at his accomplishments. Three volumes of poetry, two rock operas, a sculpture garden, four romance novels, and who can forget his touching portrayal of Billy Bigelow in our all-psychotic production of Carousel. On several of the board getting misty-eyed at the memory of the brilliant performance, Directed by our own Dr. Annabelle Leek. On Dr. Annabelle Leek, the hospital's icily beautiful, ultra cool top shrink. A moment later, Casanova addresses them. His manner is charming, sincere, his so voice soft, filled with emotion. He is the master of seduction. 20 years ago, I was a lost soul. Loveless, fatherless, a <clears throat> psycho. Oh, how could I have done it? The murder, the mayhem, all of those lovely young girls. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Dr. Beers wipes the tears from his eyes. Reactions from the board moved as Casanova weeps convulsively. Dr. Leake shows no reaction. But my deeds have been done, and my use is gone. And we can only go forward in this cool world. And if I have learned anything from my wretched life, it is that when you walk through a storm, keep your head held high. Uh -huh. Tears plop down the cheeks of the review board as the fully orchestrated strains of when you walk through a storm well. Series of shots as the music continues. A hand stamps Casanova style cured. Casanova shakes hands and embraces the tearful members of the review board, finishing with a patron hug from Dr. Beers. In his cell, a guard delivers Casanova his favorite old disco suit that's been waiting for him for 20 years. Casanova, dressed in the suit, walks down the center aisle of the lockup. A moment later, he steps out of a massive gate of the hospital and takes his first deep breath of freedom. 
While in an office window high above, Bierce and the members of the review board stand watching, very proud. But suddenly the music changes to 70s disco as a black Ferrari drives up and Dr. Lee, now dressed very sexily, gets out. As the review board watches in stunned silence, Casanova and Annabelle perform a misty little disco twirl, finishing with a very lewd kiss. Bierce watches, realizes he's been duped. As Casanova grinning up at him, he puts on a long gold chain, his favorite weapon, around his neck. Bierce, horrified, picks up the telephone as Casanova and Annabelle get in the car. Interior of the car, a moment later. Casanova and Annabelle drive off. The massive old hospital is seen through a rear window behind them as Casanova calmly looks at his watch, close on his watch. As the second hand just swings toward the 12, it's exactly 12 noon, back on Casanova. Boom. And the hospital explodes in a huge fireball that completely consumes it. Those gas leaks can be murder. Exterior, the road, the road day. The Ferrari drives past and the camera holds on a sign that reads, Welcome to Champion City, home of Captain Amazing. The city itself, a crumbling rust belt met metropolis, a la Detroit, can be seen stretched out along the shore of Lake Champion off in the distance. Inside the car, continuous on Casanova. Back on the road, continuous. The Ferrari drives up a much large, larger billboard that looms over the road, showing a picture of Captain Amazing himself, a square-jawed superhero, staring fiercely into the camera. The caption reads, crime. Don't even think about it. Exterior, train yards of Champion City night. Letters read, six months later, as the camera explores the desolate, muddy terrain of the train yards, cruising past the piles of tires and abandoned train cars. Camera picks up a battered van as it drives through the yard, then pulls up beside an old box car. The back of the van is thrown open, a ramp is thrown down, and the red eyes, a gang of vicious small town thieves, all of whom wear sunglasses with red lenses, start unloading their night's haul. Red Eye One drives the golf cart with clubs down the ramp. Off anyone? Several more red eyes emerge carrying a swan, a, a swan off, a swan off. Aha, bike rack with bikes still attached, a barber pole, a Virgin Mary lawn statue, and a top of in the top of the lawn baby stroller, while their leader, Big Red, stands in the door to the box car watching approvingly. Not a bad night's work. Who said crime don't pay? The red eyes laugh as Red Eye Three <laughs> takes the cover off the baby stroller and sees that there's a baby still in it. Hey boss, we got a stowaway. <laughs> The crooks gather around the baby, a jolly little kid who just laughed at him. Who are you laughing at, punk? He's just a tyke. Lighten up. He's kind of cute. I feel like drool. Hey, why don't we sell him back to his parents for a million bucks? <sighs> the other thinks that that's a great idea, but Big Red does not. And what if he rats on us? The others hadn't thought of that. <sighs> so what should we do with him? Stick a brick in his pampas and dump him in the lake. The others <sighs> think that's a good idea and look around for a brick. Come on, kid, you're going for a swim. But suddenly, there's a presence. A man in a blue turban and a cape with the initials BR on his chest has appeared. He is the Blue Raja. Not so fast, gentlemen. And I use that term loosely. Unhand that youngster. Another man steps into the light. He wears a construction helmet and mask. There is an S on his chest and he carries an old shovel. He is the shoveler. Or your mulch. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's stupid. <laughs> he brandishes <laughs> his shovel for effect. The red eyes look at these two, highly amused. What are you supposed to be? Superheroes? A third man steps out. His costume is less dramatic than the others. He wears an old leather jacket and a faded torn shirt with flames on it. But the fierce look on his face and the atrociousness of his haircut makes it very clear. He is the craziest and most dangerous of the three. He is Mr. Furious. We are superheroes. Really? Did your mother make those costumes? <laughs> <laughs> this is our territory. Beat it! over your dead body. Big Red turns to the others and shakes with pretended fear. Ooh, he's scary! <laughs> <laughs>
Then he, the red eyes laugh, but suddenly a small silver projectile whizzes through the air and implants itself in Big Red's backside. He howls with pain and pulls it out and examines it. It's a silver dessert fork. A fork? The Raja holds up his hands, each of which hold a spread of silver fork. And there's plenty more where that came from. Big Red gives a shrill whistle and a dozen more red eyes step out of the old caboose, including Mikey, a 400 pound behemoth. He is eating a container of Ben and Jerry's ice cream and takes huge bites out of it, container and all. Raja and Shovel are reacting, gulp. This was more than they bargained for, but Furious just growls, he's game. Get him! The red eyes attack. Mr. Furious goes into a furious face. His hair stands straight out and he rushes right into the oncoming crooks. A red eye takes a swing at the shoveler, but he simply puts up his shovel and lets the crooks slung the shovel's pan. The crook yelps with pain and shakes his battered hand as Raja fends off the crooks, poking them with salad forks, and the baby sits in the stroller, watching, laughing, really enjoying the show. There's no real martial artistry or teamwork here. This is classic back alley brew hall. Hall. Hall? <laughs> but there's <laughs> too many of them. The Raja goes down under swinging fists, and so does the shoveler. Furious holds his own, taking out the crooks with powerful lefts and rights, but Mikey runs, runs at him like a truck, falling right on top of him and crushing under him in his massive weight. Crush him, Mikey! Yeah! yeah! Woo! yeah! <laughs> He wants more! Squish him! Finish him off! <laughs> Mikey sweating bears down and suddenly a calm, very authoritative voice is heard. Is there a problem? Everything suddenly stops as the red eyes look up and see Captain Amazing standing on top of the boxcar, hands on hips, framed in the light of the moon, his biceps bulging, the state-of-the-art physique sculpted body armor gleaming in the moonlight, his cape wafting heroically in the wind. He is a superhero perfection incarnate on the red eyes as their viciousness turns instantly to panic. It's Captain Amazing! Ah! Big Red and a couple of others try to run for it, but Amazing leaps cat-like off the boxcar and, and is on them in a flash. As the baby claps his hands in delight, our other three heroes watch and beat up all. Amazing definitely takes out the crooks with expert punches and effortlessly, de effort effortlessly delivers elbows and kicks. He is the consummate superhero and he doesn't even break a sweat. The remaining red eyes drop to their knees and throw up their hands and surrender. I'm so sorry, I'm, 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 I'm guilty of peer pressure. I was just pressured into it. Police cars and a TV truck come screeching into the train yard and the scene is suddenly flooded with light and swarming with cops and reporters. Our three heroes try to approach Captain Amazing, who still looks fresh as a daisy. Nice work, Captain. But Amazing just walks past them, ignoring them completely as if they didn't exist. He goes to greet Don Wong, Champion City's answer to Connie Chung. Hi, Don. Looks as if you've done it again, Captain. It's what I do. Our heroes just watch, feeling ignored, humiliated, furious growls. Suddenly, two cops are accosting them. Okay, show's over. Move it on. On your way. Wait a minute, officers. You don't understand. We're superheroes. We just busted up this gang. Really? Let me guess. You're Towelhead? And he's Captain Pooper Scooper. The cops crack up, furious growls at him. The cops yank out their nightstick. Hey, move it. Get a life. And leave crime fighting to the real thing. Shoveler and Raja pull Furious away before he gets into real trouble. The cops watch as our three heroes disappear into the night. Wannabes. Pathetic. Exterior, the lakeside diner, night. Establishing, an inner city greasy spoon. The interior, the diner, continuous, close on a TV screen. On which Captain Amazing, the laughing baby in his arms, is being interviewed by Don Wong. He's playing the cutesy photo. He's playing the cutesy. Oh man. Cutesy photo out for all it's worth. Gucci gooing the kid, etc. Don is creaming. What? Our three heroes sit sit in the booth in the back of the diner watching the tube. He doesn't get a trick, does he? A jerk. 
And like nobody knows who he really is. Oh, don't start that again. Look! Sirius picks up the newspaper in which there's a photo of a good looking guy on a tux at a benefit. The headline reads, Lance Hunt, host benefit. He holds the picture up next to the television so the faces of Lance Hunt and Captain Amazing are side by side. It is obviously the same guy. He's Lance Hunt. Just take off the glasses and it's him. There's a vague similarity. A vague similarity? It's the same guy! Ugh. Who gives a damn who he is? I can't take this anymore. Night after night we're on the streets busting our humps and for what? He takes the licks and he gets the chicks. How long do you have to chase a dream before you realize it's not gonna happen? We need a break, that's all. Nobody's ever heard of him until he busted Casanova Frankenstein. But look at him. Look at us. Camera loves him. Press silence. Furious turns his attention to the napkin dispenser. Why do they always fill stuff like these so full you can't pull them out without ripping them? I lost my fork and I didn't just take it. So why don't you just tell her? Come on. Why not? Because I can't, okay? She, she wouldn't understand. Leave him alone. She's his mother, not yours. Get an off night, that's all. But when are we going to have an on night? A waitress is standing at the table. Hi. They look at her, taken aback. She's very pretty. You're new. It's my first night. My name is Monica. Close on Furious. Smitten by her, but almost afraid to look at her under all that rage. He's in fact shy. You guys going to a costume party? We are superheroes. Really? Like Captain Amazing? Growl. Are you famous? Not yet. So you're like struggling superheroes? We prefer to think of ourselves as unsung. I am Blue Raja, master of silverware. Wow. Um, these are my associates, Shadler. Hi. And uh, Mr. Furious. His anger is his power. Really? Usually a superpower is a magical endowment or a great skill. In his case, it's entirely emotional. So, what can I get you? Uh, burgers all around. Medium, rare, raw. A moment later, as Monica walks away, Furious can't help but watch her. The Raja replaces the diner's dinnerware with the good stuff from his coat. She likes you. Definitely. Ask her out. Uh. Roy, when's the last time you had an actual date? What does it matter? Women just want to control you and talk about their feelings. They want to know why you're angry all the time and what they can do to help. So you just tell them there's nothing, nothing. Just leave me alone. And they bug you and they bug you and they bug you until you just can't stand it anymore. So you finally open up, you pop like a blister and all comes spewing out all your emotions, your feelings, your fear, all of it. And then they dump you. So you're chicken. Who's chicken? Monica stands at the counter, placing her order. Furious approaches her, leans against the counter. For a moment, he just stands there, fuming, unable to think of anything to say. She isn't sure what to make of this. Doesn't it piss you off the way, oh, the way when you really want to talk to somebody but you can't think of anything to say? I guess. Are you always so angry? Only when I'm awake. You sure. busy after work? Want to go and get drunk? He's visibly turned off by that. Or talk? Not tonight. Exterior outside the diner later. Furious, the Raja, and the Shoveler step out. Maybe you should try a more romantic approach. Like what? Cutting off my own ear? Or flowers? See you tomorrow. Furious kicks his engine started and speeds off into the night as the Shoveler opens the door of his battered Ford Esquire station wagon and the Raja gets into his ancient Jackson, Jackson. Ex uh, exterior residential street night. The shoveler pulls into the driveway of his very modest house. The front yard looks like a battle zone. Bikes and kids' junks are everywhere. Living room, a moment later. As big as, big as disaster area as the front yard, his kids, Eddie Jr., 15, Lenore, 12, Butch, 10, Tracy, 7, and Roland, 5, are all sprawled in front of the TV. The shoveler enters, and his kids don't even bother to look up from the tube. Hey, when are you guys going to clean this place up? 
We're here on TV. Great, like that will ever happen. Have you any babies lately? On the shoveler, silent, hurt. Faster than a speeding turtle. More powerful than a deodorant. Able to eat 12 donuts in a single sitting. Look, snoring in his chair. Sitting on the john. It's, it's super good. Super good. <laughs> Kids all laugh in that <laughs> diversive way that kids do so well. As the shoveler dejectedly walks into the kitchen, interior kitchen a moment later, the shoveler enters dejected. His wife, Lucille, is doing the dishes. She looks up, sees him. Rough night, Eddie? He nods. Exterior, the Raja house, night establishing. The Raja's Datsun is parked in front of a neat as pin little Victorian house. Interior, the dining room, night. The room is dark. Someone is sneaking around. A drawer is quietly opened, and we hear a gentle clink of silver. Suddenly, the light goes on, and we see Blue Raja, now dressed in a sport coat and slacks, with the hands with his hands in the drawer. His mother, in her night clothes, stands by the door where she had just switched on the light. Jeffrey. Oh, hi, mom. What are you doing in the silver drawer? Looking for the TV guide. She just looks at him, very suspicious. It's on the television. Cool. Thanks, Mommy. Go to bed. He kisses her and goes into the next room. Camera holds on Mom. She doesn't trust him. Exterior hilltop night. Angle on. A billboard overlooking the city. Captain Amazing is posed wearing a bright blue, bright blue Nike. The caption reads, It's a nice world. Somebody's got to save it. The Nike shoot, super shoe. It's amazing. Furious sits on his Harley, taking long hauls from a pint bottle of cheap bourbon and gazing up at the sun. Amazing. What's so amazing about him? I'd be amazing too if I'd inherited 200 million bucks or two bucks, two cents. Who am I kidding? Dreams don't come true. A moment of despondency. Despons he then hears a strange sound overheard and looks up. His point of view, as something suddenly flies across the star-filled sky above him, it is Captain Amazing wearing a high-tech rocket pack on his back. Where's he going? Series of shots with music as Furious Falling Captain Amazing rides, rides down the steep hill, skidding onto the road and speeding through a residential area. He cuts onto some railroad tracks, hops into his bike up on the rail, and rides smoothly along it, falling amazing. He turns off the tracks, rides roughly through some woods and then emerges from trees and sees a forbidden looking old mansion. Captain Amazing lands on the highest part of its roof. Furious pulls up, gazes at the front gates of the mansion. His point of view. Letters across the iron gates read Frankenstein. Exterior on the roof, continuous. Captain Amazing abandons his jetpack and moves across the old slate roof like Spider-Man, leaping nimbly from gable to gable and walking along a high ridge like a tightrope walker. Finally, he approaches a skylight and looks down and sees a huge old library with an iron catwalk running around it. Casanova Frankenstein <coughs> sits in a club chair by a roaring fire. Annabelle perches on the arm of his chair. In the other chair sits one good looking, now paunchy guy with a meticulously puffed haircut. He is Tony Pompad Pompadour, head of the infamous Disco Boys on Captain Amazing. Uh-huh. He sees that the skylight is open and quietly lets himself in. Interior, the library continuous. Casanova and Tony P savor glasses of brandy and puff on big cigars. I hope you enjoy these cigars. I had to kill a dozen Cubans to get them. Mm. Have you considered my offer? You know, Mr. F, me and the boys always loved working for you. You had such style, the clothes, the dancing, the elegant way you'd uh, snuff out a babe. <laughs> you were the king. But uh, times have changed, and you've been in that bug house a long time. I can see you still got the style, but I don't know for sure you still got the edge. I got it. What about Captain Amazing? Good question. 
Essanova and Tony P look up and see Captain Amazing pose nonchalantly on the iron catwalk, gazing down at them. Tony P jumps out of his chair, scared, but Casanova just smiles at his ancient eyeball, cool as a cucumber. Ah, I knew you would scam. I left that skylight open for you. I know you did. I knew you'd know. And I know you knew I'd know. But did you know I knew you'd know that I knew? Of course. Tony P makes a move for his pistol, but Captain Amazing instantly whips out his pistol, getting the drop on him. I'd hate to waste a good bullet on a piece of scum like you, Tony. Tony freezes. The jig is up, Casanova. I'd spent six months watching you, and I know exactly what you're up to. Oh, really? I know that you're recruiting your old henchman. Uh, Nervous reaction. I know, who you regro- I know who your girlfriend really is. I see reaction from Annabelle. And I know the terrible revenge that you plan on to that you plan to inflict on this city. I guess you know everything about. Uh, I guess you know just about everything, don't you, <laughs> Lance? Um. Mm-hmm. Except for one little thing. And what's that? That I've hotwired the city's entire power supply through that catwalk. What? Casanova suddenly throws a secret breaker switch and the ugly hum of a million volts instantly fills the room. Exterior outside the house continue as on Furious, still watching as all the lights in the house go out except for a frightening orange glow in the upper room. Off in the distance, Furious sees the lights of the entire city flicker and then black out. A moment later, the mansion and the city's lights return to normal as Furious watches, not sure what to make of this. Exterior, street construction street construction site day. Traffic is snarled. Horns are blasting. Timbers are frayed. Close on a hammering jackhammer. Camera widens to reveal that it's being operated by the shoveler. Dressed in a dress and work clothes, wiped out from the night before. The vibrations of the hammer are lulling him off to sleep. He nods out as his boss whacks him on the arm. Yo, Captain Simon next. Get your shut eye at home or you'll be a full-time superhero. Exterior, the Raja's house day establishing. Interior, the Raja room continuous. The Raja lies sprawled on his bed, depressed, still in his PJs as he watches an Anthony Robbins infomercial on the TV. It's all within your power. The only thing that's in your way, you. You sick. Exterior, Sally's auto demolition day establishing. An auto junkyard and demolition yard. Exterior, the yard day. A giant press matches an old car while nearby Mr. Furious does the job by hand, demolition, demolitioning an old pre with an iron bar. He does it as easily as a normal guy would tear apart a con- congregated box, a box, ripping off the doors and tearing off the bumpers in the hood and tossing the pieces onto a big pile. His big boned, red faced boss, Sally, is calling out to him. Hey, right! Exterior, the back of the yard, a minute later. In a weedy, overgrown far corner of the junkyard, Sally and Furious stand looking at a big old hunk of military vehicle. It is a Herkimer battle j- jitney. Did I say that right? Just to, okay, okay, sorry. A uh, heavily armored, windowless, soundproof personal carrier. Designed by the Pentagon in the 50s to take congressmen on battlefield finding or fact finding tours. Overgrown with weeds, home to an extended family of pigeons, its fighting days, if there ever were any, are over. How many times do I gotta tell you about this? Sally, that's a Herkimer battle chitney. They don't make them like that anymore. It's a classic. It's a hunk of junk. I want the iron. Do it. She walks away. Furious growls. He picks up the iron bar and is about to wedge it under the front bumper of the Herkimer. His point of view. But the old headlights and the sad old grill seem to be looking at him, imploring him for one last chance. He just can't do it. He throws away his iron bar and climbs inside the cab of the Herkimer. In the cab, continuous. Furious sits behind the wheel and tenderly touches its beat up old dashboard, then turns on the radio, which miraculously still works. He tunes in the local station, puts up his feet on the dash. And continues to deny any knowledge of the incident. In local news, millionaire Lance Hunt has apparently disappeared. 
on Furious immediately taking notice. Members at his asshole told police that the Playboy philanthropist failed to return home last night after going out for a walk. Police say they have no reason yet to suspect foul play, but a search is underway. Interior, the diner, night. Furious, the shoveler, and the Rajah all sit at their booth. I saw him go in and he didn't come out. He didn't. No, for sure. The same guy. Hey, look. On the TV, Casanova is being interviewed by Don Stoffer, the local Mike Wallace. Well, Don, I've done some terrible things in my life, but now I'm cured. I just want to give back something to my old hometown. That's why I'm using what's left of my fortune to build. Close on a model of a huge concrete bumper-like institutional structure, Ligeti. The Frankenstein Center for the Arts! Okay, haven't you? Oh, yes. Back on Furious, Raja and the Shoveler. Oh, he has it. Exterior, Frankenstein Mansion, night, angle on, the wall of the estate as our heroes three heads rise up over, head to rise up over it in the survey and survey the ground. Let's go. Wait. Their point of view. A group of men are hanging around the door to the house, smoking, chatting, and laughing. A closer angle reveals that they are all dressed in the height or depth of 70s disco fashion. One of them is showing off some steps. Our heroes fall back behind the safety of the wall and confer. It's just bad. Who are they? Disco boys. Who? They're the most vicious gang of thugs the city's ever produced. 20 years ago, they were casting over the personal bodyguard. They used to bust at me. Crawled into the woodwork. Well, they've crawled back out. We may be getting in over our heads here. Looks like a job for Superman. Batman. Or both. Don't you guys get it? If Captain Amazing is still in there, we can rescue him and get on TV. They share an exasperated look, then scramble over the wall after him. Interior Casanova's bedroom continuous. Casanova and Dr. Annabelle Leak are preparing for bed. Annabelle sits in front of a huge mirror, brushing her long hair as Casanova messes, uh, moves up behind her and puts his hands around her throat, massaging, squeezing, just barely resisting the temptation to strangle her. She loves it. Everything is going exactly as we planned. Not quite. You haven't announced our engagement yet. It must have slipped my mind. Your mind is so slippery. Don't worry, Poochki. My womanizing days are over. You're my... Lady Macbeth, my Imelda, my Nicole. We are such an incredible team. Who could possibly stop us? At right to exterior, the lawn continuous on our three heroes as they crutch their way non too stealthily across the backyard. And crunch the leaves. All right. We have a weekend. Wait. They all listen. There is a low rushing sound. It is the sound of water rushing through the pipe. Suddenly, the lawn sprinklers all pop up and our heroes get drenched. They duck off the lawn behind the cover of a large tree. Oh, I'm sick. <laughs> I drink. Shh. You're Mohican. Shut up. Furious sees a pair of French doors off of a small patio. One of the doors is slightly open. They start sneaking toward it, but as they cross the patio, they trip the automatic security lighting and suddenly find themselves bathed in light. Uh oh. As our heroes look around, as a dozen disco boys armed with pipes, chains, brass knuckles, step into the light and encircle them, the French doors open and Tony P steps out. Oh, I'm sorry, we must, we must have the wrong house. Yeah, you do. The disco boys attack. The Raja is instantly clubbed down. The shoveler deflects only a blow or two with his shovel before he goes down, too. These guys are not the red eyes. Only Furious holds his own. He grabs a pipe away from one of them and swings fiercely, keeping the others off. Suddenly, the disco boys pull back. Furious doesn't know why until he turns and sees Casanova standing right behind him, smiling. I see. With a cat-like move, Casanova slashes his gold chain viciously and repeatedly across Furious's face. Furious 
stunned with pain, lunges at Casanova, who neatly steps aside, then catches him with a fast combination of spinning disco kicks. Finally, he lashes the chain around Furious's neck and pulls it in tightly, strengthening him. On the disco boys, watching, snapping their fingers with admiration. Casanova releases Furious, who slumps to the ground. Casanova steps away, and the disco boys gather around Furious and kick him viciously. As Casanova and Tony P watch, amused, chuckling. Superheroes. <laughs> Should I kill them? Why Bazzi? Exterior, house. Uh, just outside the mansion a moment later. The disco boys drag our heroes through the gate and throw them like bags of garbage into the street where they lie in a moaning, agonized, semi-conscious heat. Interior, the diner, later on, close, close on, furious, rubbing his neck. A thin red mark runs around it. The three of them are sitting at their usual table in very bad shape, moaning and groaning. Monica approaches. She's made them an ice pack and cold compresses. Here you go. Ow. Maybe you guys ought to forget this superhero stuff and join the Kiwanis or something. A fussy customer is calling out from another table. Miss! She moves off. She's right. Serious? This is the break we've been waiting for. What are you talking about? What have the famous superheroes got that we don't? Agents? Arch enemies. Casanova isn't just a criminal, he's a supervillain. Stopping him could be our ticket to fame, fortune, and babes. And it would be the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah, and that too. But there's only three of us, and he has an entire brotherhood of evil at his disposal. Then maybe it's time for us to form our own brotherhood. A brotherhood of righteous, crime-fighting, skull-cracking, disco boy-bashing, warriors of the night. I'm liking this. I say we send out the word and summon all of the unsung superheroes we know. Yeah. But who do we know? It took a long moment to ponder this. Well, there's the spleen. <laughs> do, do we have to? I got this cousin. He's a real doofus, but he claims he can become invisible. Have you ever seen him? Well, how could I see him if he's invisible? <laughs> Good point. And there is the Sphinx. The who? Well, he's this legendary masked crime-fighting super wrestler and master of a machete. Sounds good. No one's sure he actually exists. He's terribly mysterious. But they say he can be contacted by leaving a message on a crumpled up napkin at the Taki Taco down at the bus station. Get out of here. Exterior Taki Taco Day establishing. A funky Mexican restaurant by the bus station. Interior, the restaurant continuous. Our heroes, in normal clothing, have just finished taco lunch. Furious is writing a message on a napkin with a ballpoint pen. You sure that's how you spell it? Yeah. Close on the note, which reads, Sphinx, we need you. They crumble up the napkin and leave the restaurant. A moment later, a shy-looking man uh, busses their tray, but in a close angle, we see him secretly pocket the napkin. Exterior house day, establishing a little brick house. Interior invisible boys room day. A teenage boys room decorated to the max with models and posters of great superheroes. Batman, Superman, Sp Batman, Spider-Man, Captain Amazing, etc. Invisible boy, about 15, is being interviewed by Raja, Mr. Furious, and the Shoveler. So let me get this straight. You have the power to become invisible. Yes. But only when no one is looking. Yes. If someone looks at you, you immediately become visible again. Yep. So you're only invisible to yourself? No. No? No? If I look at myself, I become visible. So you're only invisible when absolutely no one is looking at you? Yes. So how do you know that you've ever been invisible? I just know. Our heroes are less than impressed. Look, kid, we've got a lot of heroes to interview. I, I know I haven't got it entirely worked out yet, but I've always dreamed of becoming a superhero. Weren't you, weren't you guys ever a kid? Don't you, you ever need someone to just give you a chance? On our heroes, looking around the room and softening up. 
Interior of the diner night, our heroes sit at their usual t table along with Invisible Boy and a weird looking guy in a greasy stained yellow superhero outfit. Across his chest and falling off stick on letters, it reads, The Queen. And that's exactly who he is. Furious, the Raja, and Shoveler sit far away from him as possible. He is a total obnoxious, hyperactive person, and he is thrilled to be there. What? I don't know how thrilled I was when you guys called. You need that pickle? Mm. Huh. <laughs> I've always dreamed of being a member of a real superhero team. To have friends, like real friends. And, I mean, I guess I could live with, sleep with, die with, eat with. <laughs> oh. He puts, he puts the mustard dispenser to his oh. and squeezes it straight into his mouth. Oh, I love mustard. <laughs> Furious Raja and the Shoveler react. They can't believe they've actually invited this guy to join their group. Uh. What exactly is your superpower? Oh, well, uh, excuse me. Well, when I was a kid, I grew up on the Love Canal. Remember that? Uh, and my brothers and I used to go swimming in it, make Kool-Aid in it, you know, stuff like that. Anyway, my brothers all died. <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, I grew in, uh, uh, like, all these weird organs that have never been seen in humans before. So now I can do things like this. He leans over the table and lets just a little tiny drop of spittle dribble onto the table. Close on the table as the spittle burns a hole in the, yeah, in the table. Cool, huh? <laughs> Sorry. The spleen inadvertently gives the tiniest little burp and our three heroes duck out of the way under the table. Watch right, it! Oh. Sorry! Sorry! <laughs> The people in the next booth give a cry of revulsion, put their hands to their mouths, and immediately leave. Sorry, sorry. Hey, why don't you just put a cork in it? I tried that once. It melted. <laughs> the same after dinner. Our heroes mull their situation over coffee. Monica freshens their cups. The spleen squirts mustard into the coffee. There's just not enough of us. But we know they're out there. Hundreds, maybe thousands of lonely, unknown superheroes who desperately need a cause. And a social life. Yeah, but how do we get to them? Obscene phone calls? They ignore that suggestion. Why don't you throw a barbecue? On our heroes, realizing that's it. Interior, invisible boy's room, night with music. Invisible Boy sits at the desk in his room, writing immaculate little notes on a small file card. He has made a whole pile of them. Close on the note, which reads, got superpowers? Wanna fight evil? Then join us and let's party hardy. Beer, burgers, babes. Series of shots music continues. As our heroes post these notes all over the city and places where lonely superheroes might find them, the Raja posts a note on the door of a comic book store. The shoveler posts a note on the bulletin board at the bowling alley. Mr. Furious tapes a note to a crackled glass of vandalized phone booth. At an abandoned drive-in movie theater, Invisible Boy walks through the empty lot, taping a note on each old speaker post. A White Castle hamburger joint inside the paid toilet, Spleen is scratching something on the wall with a nail. He stops and admires his handiwork, and we see that he has engraved the entire message on the wall. End music. Exterior, Shoveler's Backyard, Day. A small, typical working class backyard, a round aluminum above ground pool, a Weber grill with burgers on it, unopened packages of hamburger rolls, an old Vic Damon record plays at the boom box. The spleen floats around on a rubber raft in the pool. Come in, the water's great! In fact, the water is turning yellowish green. The rest of our heroes sit around on cheap folding chairs. No superheroes have shown up. The shoveler at the grill serves burgers to his kids who stand in line waiting for him. Great picnic, Dad. Big turnout. Are these guys real superheroes? They think so. The kids scoff. A moment later, they head back into the house with their burgers. But where's Captain Amazing? He wouldn't be caught dead here. They go into the house. No one says anything. The shoveler just stares at the burgers on the grill. Vic Damon sings. Furious chugs his beer. He's working himself into a really morose mood. 
on the spleen, munching on a chlorine tablet. Hey, these pool mints are delicious. Raja looked at his watch. Maybe there was traffic? Kidding. No one's going to show. We're living in a fantasy. Come on, guys. We're fighting against evil. Good or evil? What's the difference? There's a big difference. I used to believe that. Now I'm not so sure. Right. Remember, it's all within your power. The only thing that's in your way. You. Oh, shut up. Suddenly, there is a knock at the gate. Everyone immediately perks up. They're here! A moment later, they open the gate and see a half a dozen burly guys wearing various superhero outfits. Hey, man. Is this a superhero wingding? This is it. Come on in. All right! right. Yeah! <laughs> at first glance, these guys seem promising, but their outfits are decidedly Im improvised. Uh, weird goggles and sunglasses, shower caps, baseball caps with beer cans on them. Their leader holds a squeegee with a long handle. Furious and suspicious. I am Blue Raja, master of silverware. I am the squeegee man, and these are my compadres, the invisible dudes, invincible dudes. The invincible dudes spot the keg. Whoa! Ooh, yeah! <laughs> They immediately go to the keg and start filling beer cups and guzzling them down. The Raja tries to hand out in some form. Here, would you mind filling these out with the, uh, your names, addresses, description of superpowers, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Hey. No problem. <laughs> I'm furious watching, starting to get pissed off. Hey, man, like, where are the babes? It said on the card that there would be babes? Actually, we lied about the babes, but there's plenty of burgers. Oh, no babes! We got I the came for babes. No babes, no peace. No babes, no peace. No babes, no peace. No babes. No 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 Let's try some babes. Yeah. Sure. Serious, <laughs> fed up, confronts. Squeegee man. If you're a superhero, what's your power? I am the squeegee man. Touch my squeegee and you die. The invisible dudes are invincible dudes are cracking up. <laughs> Can you fly? No. Wanna bet? Exterior outside the yard continuous as squeegee man comes flying and screaming over the fence landing none too gracefully in the front yard. A beat and a squeegee come flying out after him. Another beat and the invincible dudes come running out the gate in a panic. Not cool, bro! Not cool! Get out of here, man! They take off down the street, running past a woman carrying a bowling ball bag and dressed in a faded, threadbare, old rayon superhero costume with a decidedly 50s flavor. She is the bowler. Exterior, shoveler's backyard a moment later. Our heroes sit around the patio, dejected, miserable. Who died? They look up, see her standing there, and aren't quite sure what to make of her. Who are you? I'm the bowler. Bowler? I remember him from when I was a kid. He was killed years ago. I'm his daughter. Our heroes share a look. Uh, look, honey, being a superhero, it's a guy thing. Really? She takes her bowling ball, spins it around at the tip of her finger like a Harlem Globetrotter. For a, mo for a long moment, she just looks at them smiling. On the others watching, almost mesmerized by the spinning ball. Suddenly, she gives her ear-splitting battle cry and starts swinging the ball around in a wide, ferocious arc, like a cannonball in a war club or a twirler on meth. Cannibal! Cannibal with a war club or a twirler on meth going so fast she almost becomes a blur. Then, just as suddenly, she stops aims and rolls her ball. It shoots straight through the invisible boy's leg on a neatly placed collection of plaster lawn drawers. As the ball smashes into them, pulverizing them, it goes into a reverse spin, passing through invisible boy's leg again and returns to the bowler who is holding its bag open for it. The ball rolls in. The ball. On our heroes, left absolutely speechless. 
if it could zip up its own bag, then you'd be impressed, right? She turns and walks out. Our heroes share an amazed look and then run after her. Just outside the gate on the bowler, walking away as Furious catches up with her. Hey, can I buy your beer? I thought you'd never ask. She takes his arm and they all start walking back into the shoveler's backyard, but the camera pans across the street to the dark place between two houses where a man wearing a strange steel mask with a frightening, impassively powerful expression stands in the deep shadows, watching the motionless, predatory silence. We don't know. <coughs> We don't know who he is. We cannot tell if he is good or evil. Back at the barbecue, a little later, close on, a faded old snapshot of the original, the bowler, holding a little girl in his arms. He was more than just a superhero. He was my father. The others, touched by this, have gathered around the bowler who is holding the old snapshot in her hand. And then one day, he didn't come home. The police said it was an accident, but cargo containers don't just fall on people. He was murdered. After that, I fell apart. I dropped out of school, became a mud wrestler, married and divorced a jerk. When my mother died, I hit bottom. But then, when I was cleaning out her attic, I found my father's old bowling bag and costume, almost like he'd left them there for me, and I knew what I had to do. So, who killed him? The Disco Boys. You know something? Those guys are really starting to piss me off. But there's still only six of us. But what? That's two more than the Fantastic Four. Half a dirty dozen. Twice the Three Stooges. And only one short of the Magnificent Seven. And you can't count Hulk Buck with anyway. He was cute, though. We all have one thing that we haven't got. Girlfriends? A name. All the great superhero teams have got Fabulous name. They all think about it for a moment. You can almost smell their brains overheating. How about the Savage Six? The inscrutable six. The Six Pistols. The Exterminators. Obliterators. The Eradicators. The Emasculators. Wait, wait. I got it. I got it. The Spleen Team. Ah, ah. What's a name? Let's get to work. Uses a goff as Sirius stands and starts out. The others stand and follow him as our heroes form up their first heroic group shot. Exterior, city street, night. Music continues as a little old lady crosses the street when suddenly she looks up and sees a pair of headlights coming on fast. An immaculately maintained 70s limo is heading straight for her. Inside the limo continuous. Disco boys sit in the front. Casanova, Annabelle, and Tony P sit in the back dressed for a night on the town. There is a thud. As the limo hits the old lady and everyone in the car explodes with into laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Little old lady, that's a hundred points! <laughs> Inside, outside the limo a few minutes later, as the limo drives past a billboard with an ad for milk, with a milk mustache Captain America looking into the camera. He knows your every move. <laughs> As they pass the billboard, a pair of headlights emulate in the shadows and the shoveler's Ford Esquire pulls out and follows. Inside the Esquire continuous, the shoveler is driving. Mr. Furious sits in the front seat next to him and our other heroes are packed into the back. Say hello. Inside, outside, the two cars continuous. As the limo stops at the traffic light and the Esquire pulls up alongside of it, for a moment, good and evil stare each other down. Not these guys again. <laughs> nice car. <laughs> the D-boys laugh. Furious stares at Casanova. Uh, and Casanova stares right back at him. Cool as a snake. What did you do with Captain Amazing? Captain who? Hey, in the back seat. Who are you supposed to be? The bowler? I am his daughter. <laughs> his daughter? Well, guess what, sweetheart? I'm the one who squished your daddy. And he squished real good. 
The villains laugh and Mr. Furious explodes into rage. He swings open his car door, mashing it into the limo and leaving a big dent. Hey! Excuse me! He starts punching the limo like a punching bag, putting big dents in it. Waste them! Tony and the boys all reach into their coats for their pistols, but as they yank them out, the spleen sticks his head out of the station wagon, puts his face right up into the open window of the limo, and lets loose with a tremendous belt. As the villains choke and gag in the nauseous fumes, Mr. Furious goes on a demolition rampage, working his way around the limo, punching big dents with his fist, franking the windows with his head, flattening the tires by kicking them, knocking off the rear view mirror with the back of his hand. Then he leaps up onto the limo, while inside the villains gasp for air as big dents are stomped into the roof above them. Angle through the windshield as Furious leaps onto the hood and gazing into at them. Shall I check your oil? He plunges his hand through the metal of the hood, pulls out the car's dip dip, injects it. Looks fine. <laughs> he tosses the dipstick away, then <laughs> leaps off just as Tony P gets off a shot, exploding the windshield of the limo. Furious lands safely on the hood of the station wagon. As the shoveler throws the Esquire into gear, Furious shouts. Nice car! and our heroes streak off into the night. Casanova and the others stagger out of the demolition limo, sucking in the clean air. Those boys got talent. And I'm gonna nip it in the bud. Angle on a darkened alley, where the man in the strange still mask can be seen watching. Exterior, a bar, later that night, establishing. A very typical, nondescript neighborhood place. Inside the bar, continuous. Our heroes stand at the bar, celebrating their first victory. Plus. Whatever our name is. They toast and drink. The same later. The spleen has passed out at the table, snoring. Shoveler and invisible <clears throat> boy sit next to him. Even his snores smell bad. Raja and the bowler sit at the bar, deep in it. But she's your mother. You gotta tell her. I can't. On Shoveler and invisible boy. That thinks all the superhero stuff is a stupid waste of time. And he plays golf, right? Yeah! Back on Raja and the bowler. I'm homely, son, and she was such a high hope for me. Medicine, law. But you're a superhero. I had a cave to turb and she wouldn't understand. I know. My girlfriends all dumped me after I put on the mask. They thought I'd lost it. In fact, you found it. They clink their glasses and drink. Back on the shoveler and invisible boy. This is your dream, and you can't ever give it up. The spleen makes weird noises in a sleep. <laughs> I wonder what he dreams about. We don't want to know. Mr. Furious sits alone in the corner, brooding, lost in his own angry thoughts. Outside the bar, continuous, a black van drives slowly past the bar. Inside the van, continuous, the van is packed with disco boys. Tony P sits in, front, in the front seat. There. His point of view. He has spotted the Ford Esquire in the park, uh, in the parking lot. Back in the bar a little later on the baller and Raja. It's late. I'm heading home. Me too. Come on, Junior. It's a school night. Just outside a moment later as our heroes carrying the spleen leave. Anybody up for a little White Castle? But suddenly the world is a whirling sass of chains and clubs as they are bushwhacked by the disco boys. Exterior and alley a, m a little later, close on Furious, as he comes to with a groan and sees the bowler and invisible boy tied up and gagged, with Raja, Shoveler, and the sling trussed up right next to him. Furious looks up and sees Tony P standing over him. Hi, cutie. Furious struggles, but he has been secured with some very heavy tire chains. Tony P takes out a large caliber revolver, flips it open to make sure it's loaded. Six losers, six bullets. Perfect. Got any last words, angry boy? Disco sucks. Disco sucks. Very good. You know what I'm going to do, angry boy? Since you're so colorful, I'm going to save you for last. He turns and points the pistol right at Invisible Boy's head. Furious struggles against his change to no avail. Sweet dreams, punk! Invisible Boy closes his eyes. 
Tony P. cocks the pistol, but suddenly there is a ring of steel. A broad blade sweeps through the air, and Tony P.'s pistol is sliced neatly in half. Holy! The man is the strange steel mask. The man in the strange steel mask is standing there. The drawn machete still in his hand. One of not. Get him! The disco boys rush the newcomer, but he slashes through their baseball caps with his machete and sends them reeling and crashing into each other with expert forearm blows, wax with the flat of his blade, and headbutts with his mask. Furious struggles to break free to join the fight, but the chains are too strong, and the stranger doesn't need any help. Tony P. flicks open a big switchblade and lunges at the stranger, who sidesteps him like a matador and swings his machete at him. Tony P. turns, about to charge again. Would you like me to trim the side? What? Tony P. fills the top of his head and realizes that the blow from the machete has neatly sliced off the top of his disco do, leaving only stubble off the top of his head. Let's get out of here! Tony and the disco boys run for it. Furious and the others study their masked savior, who stands before them, machete in hand. You're the Sphinx. <coughs> You're a fool. He raises his machete above Furious's head and then slices clean through the chain. Exterior auto demolition yard later that night. Our heroes have gathered around a scrap wood fire and a steel drum. They sit on the ground and on old car seats, feeling like schmucks as the, as the Sphinx Choose them out, his mask looking very frightening and magical in the flickering light. You call yourselves superheroes? A rooster fights more intelligently than you. You have shown yourself to your enemy and revealed your powers to him. And what have you accomplished for this? If you've destroyed his car, you have destroyed his car. Brilliant. If you want to survive this fight, you must fight like a wolf pack, not a six pack. Serious sulks, but the others get the point. The wolf is cunning. He knows that stealth is his greatest weapon. He always fights as a team. Not some drunken Tejano on a Saturday night. Here's Grunt. Captain of Frankenstein is a master of evil. You will need more than shovels and dessert forks to stop him. What else have you got? They're silent. So what else has Superman got? He's got the fact that he's Superman. Bullets bounce off him. Here he sulks again, feeling that the others are turning against him. Firepower costs money. Anybody got any? We didn't think this through very well. My father had this friend. He was an inventor. Exterior, Doc Keller's farmhouse day. Our heroes stand looking at an old farmhouse. The place is an absolute wreck. It, has been, it hasn't been painted in 25 years. Windows are boarded up. Half of the shingles are gone. There's visible fire damage around the kitchen window. Are you sure he still lives here? Are you sure he's still alive? It was the last time I saw him. When was that? I was eight. She's about to knock, but the door is suddenly yanked open, and an 80-year-old guy is standing there. He's got a wild head of white hair. <laughs> that looks like a living experience. Explosion. He wears a stained old lab coat with stick -em messages to himself stuck to it, non-matching slippers, and a pair of half-thick glasses with frames that have been composited of half a dozen old pairs, all taped and welded together into a fantastic concoction. He is Doc Heller. Yes. Dr. Heller? Yes. It's me, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Sweet Elizabeth. Why, you're so middle-aged. Thanks. How's your dad? He's dead. Oh, that's right. They squished him. Heck of a guy. Sirius throws a look at the shoveler and Raja. This guy is out of it. They're wasting their time. Doc, these are my friends. We're superheroes and we need your help. Well, I get to the United Way. I feel that sort of covers... Doctor, we need your weapons. My weapons? You need my weapons? Exterior, behind the house a minute later. Moving angle, as Doc Heller leads them all briskly across his overgrown yard toward the barn. The military establishment has never understood me. They won't return my phone calls, uh, much less field test anything. I knew that someday I'd get my chance, and now, here you are. 
Interior, the barn continuous. As our heroes step into Heller's laboratory arsenal, a stack of small aluminum cans lines one wall. There are weird looking sprayers, tubes, and strange homemade toy-like devices, but there isn't a firearm in sight. Um, Doc, where's the machine gun? The bazookas. The lasers. You don't need that junk. You see, for thousands of years, mankind has been emulating, disemboweling, and exploding itself. Why? Because we have this built-in, screwed-up need to go to war. So as a young man, I thought, why not have fun and excitement of war without all that unnecessary bloodshed? That's why I devoted my life to developing an arsenal of highly sophisticated, non-lethal military weapons. Air cannons, flamethrowers, feet-seeking missiles, and perhaps my ultimate invention, the canned tornado. Mm. Gary scrums and the others share a look. This guy's really a nut. Now here's the beauty. I call it the shrinker. I developed it a few years after uh, studying the worst dry cleaners I could find. It instantly shrinks fabrics to the half their size. Anyone caught in its spray is immediately immobilized by their own clothing. Let's get out of here. Furious turns and goes out and the others start to follow, but the bowler picks up a canned tornado. Outside the barn continuous, as Sirius walks away, the bowler steps out of the barn. Hey, Mr. Bad Mood. Sirius stops, turns back. Catch. She tosses the can to him. He catches it just as a small, angry tornado funnels out of the can. It catches Furious and lifts him high into the air, then dissipates to nothing. A beat later, Furious lands on the ground with a painful thump. On the others, amazed, Furious gets to his feet, unhurt but really pissed off. He starts back toward the barn, violently kicking the empty can. The others get out of his way as muttering angrily to himself. He goes back into the barn and emerges a moment later, toting the air cannon. He's got the air cannon! The others think he's going to use it on them and scatter for cover, but Fury steps onto the yard looking for a suitable target. He sees an old abandoned outhouse, puts the air cannon towards, uh, on his two shoulders, aims, and fires. There's a loud woof! <laughs> of the compressed air and the huge recoil of the cannon instantly flings Furious back against the wall of the barn. But the big rush of air hits the shed dead center and it blows it into pieces, leaving only the old seat. Furious gets up, dusts himself off, and moves to Doc Heller. Doc, you're a genius. I know. Okay, we got the firepower. I say we throw it into the car, drive over to Casanova's house and kick some ass. No. The others ignore Furious and listen to the Sphinx. We are not yet ready. We must learn to fight together as one thing. The others nod in agreement while Furious fumes. Montage with music, training at the farm. Close on Doc Heller aiming his air cannon. Camera pulls back to reveal our heroes, minus Furious, standing in a pack right behind him, holding him down. He fires and the recoil jolts them all violently, but he doesn't knock them over. As half a dozen scarecrows are blown into pieces, our heroes cheer and shake their fists while Mr. Fury sits alone on the sidelines drinking bourbon and feeling very alienated. Various shots at our heroes learn to fight as a team, crawling across the grass together, charging in a line, hurling canned tornadoes while Furious sits it out, brooding, drinking, and getting very jealous of the Sphinx. Shoveler, Bowler, and the Sphinx stand shoulder to shoulder as Invisible Boy, Sleen, Raja, and the Doc throw small stones at them. They deflect with pebbles, with shovel, a bowling ball, and machete. They're having fun. They're becoming a team. Exterior, outside the barn, evening. Furious drinks alone while the rest of our heroes sit around an old picnic table, feasting on sodas and pizza, like a football team after a great practice. Raja explains the history of the situation to the sink. Well, 20 years ago, all the major hoodlums of the city were united in this one great brotherhood of evil. Casanova was their king. Crime was rampant. It wasn't safe to stay in your home. Much less go outside. Then Captain Amazing appeared. He busted Casanova and sent the crooks packing. And this has been a pretty nice place to live ever since. But now Casanova's back and we're going to sit around here all night eating pizza and telling stories. Hey, let's throw some marshmallows. The wise snake coils before he strikes. And a skunk stinks! Furious and the sphinx square off, their faces only inches apart. You drink too much. When are you going to take off that mask? 
when I'm sure I'm among friends. Roy. Go dance with your mother, Jeffrey. On the Raja, hurt. Your rage is a very great power, but it blinds you to your heart. My heart died a long time ago. It is not dead. It is hiding. Blow it out your bean hole, and to hell with the rest of you. Look at you, bunch of rejects. I don't need you before, and I don't need you now. The great ones ride alone. Adios, muchachos. On the others watching him. Has he always been like this? What? Exterior country road continuous, close on furious. The wind whipping against his face as he rides his Harley at about 100 miles an hour. The the languorous sound of an old Dean Martin song is heard as we fade into memory sequence day, close on Furious, as a little boy sitting in the back seat of the family car. It is 30 years ago, and Mr. Furious is a sweet, very shy, well-behaved, perfectly normal three-year-old. His mother and father sit in the front. Dean Martin is playing on the car radio. Little Furious looks out the window and sees the Mojave Desert going by. A sign reads, Las Vegas, 120 miles. Oh, this place looks great. An old sign reads bar as the family car pulls into the parking lot of a single adobe building out in the middle of nowhere. They park. Now, honey, you just wait in the car. Mommy and daddy will be right back. They get out, lock the car, and head for the bar, leaving the windows up. Little Furious watches them, never suspecting that his entire life is about to change. He sits quietly in the back seat and plays with the little superhero figurines that he's brought with them. How? Bang! Wham! Inside the bar continuous. As the parents enter, a very western motif, an old Gene Autry song is playing on the juke. The air conditioning is on. They're the only customers in the place. It's nice and cool in here. Bar keep, a couple of cold ones. Cut back and forth between the car and bar, angle on, mid on the midday sun. Uh, blazing down on the car has little furious plays with the superheroes but the interior is starting to bake and the sweat begins to pour off of them he looks out at the bar getting worried he tries the windows but they're automatic and won't open back in the bar his parents shoot down bourbon with their beers as the bartender finishes telling them a joke and here's a banana for your monkey mom and dad have a good laugh Couple more. You bet. Angle from outside the car as Little Furious, sweat and tears pouring out of them, his hair wet and sticking out, and starting to take that familiar look, pounds on the window. Mommy, Daddy, Mommy, Daddy. As back in the bar, his parents now very drunk, down more beers and chasers as they play a spirited game of pinball. Angle on the Mojave sun beating down mercilessly, mercilessly. Bearing able, barely able to breathe, Little Furious flops back onto the seat, his face a mask of heat and terror, but suddenly a change begins to take place in him as some primordial defense mechanism kicks in and his fear begins to give way rage, his teeth bare, close on his hands as they crush the superhero figurines in their grasp. While back in the bar, his drunken parents dance a slow two-step to Hank Williams' ear cheek and heart. Exterior, the parking lot, night. Hank Williams continues as the desert moon shines on the fa down on the family car, still parked there. Inside the bar, continuous, the parents are asleep in a booth. Furious mother wakes up and looks groggy and in a moment of horror suddenly remembers. Oh my God! The parking lot, a beat later, as she runs towards the car, hysterical. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. She unlocks the car, throws it open, and sees something that makes her pull back in horror. Little Furious sits in the back seat. His hair sticks out wildly. His face has become that now familiar mask of primordial rage. Another old Dean Martin song is heard as we fade into interior, the diner night, closed on Furious. Sitting alone in the booth, a look of profound pain and loneliness on his face. He is still that little boy. The Dean Martin song is playing on the juke. Hi. He looks up and sees Monica. Hi. Alone tonight? Every night. She smiles. Exterior, the Frankenstein mansion continuous. Armed to disco boys guard the front entrance, while the hillside above invisible boy, looking through binoculars, and the spleen lie together on their bellies in the weeds, keeping the mansion under surveillance. 
adolescence was the worst. <clears throat> the other kids made fun of me, so I'd spit on them and they'd scatter. Never had a girlfriend, uh, unless you count that night with my cousin. She recovered fully, though. Uh, we exchange cards every Christmas. Well, I send her one and she sends it back. Bug repellent. Suddenly, the gates of the mansion open and several sedans followed by a truck drive out. Point of view through binoculars. Casanova and Annabelle sit in the front of the truck. Where are they going? Invisible boy hesitates just for a moment, then gets up and runs down the hill. Kid! <sighs> As the small convoy drives past, Invisible boy slips out from behind some trees, runs after the truck, jumps up, and sits on the rear bumper. The spleen comes running after him, and the invisible boy reaches out, grabs his hand, and pulls up him up alongside him. Invisible boy tries to rear, th tries the rear gate. It's open. The two of them pull it up just a foot, squirm inside, and then pull it closed behind them. Inside the truck, continuous. Invisible boy flashes the light of his keychain flashlight around the inside of the truck. There's nothing in it except for a large pile of packing blankets. Exterior, waterfront area, night. As the convoy drives through the Champion City speedy waterfront area and out onto a long pier. Interior, the diner, night, closed on the TV. Don Wong and Don Stouffer report the night news. Some of of millionaire Lance Hunt, and now in an unrelated story, another one of Champion City's leading citizens has apparently disappeared. Captain Amazing has not been seen or heard from in a week. Authorities believe that the hardworking superhero may just be taking a well-deserved rest. Cancun, perhaps? Sounds good to me, Don. Mr. Furious sits in the booth drinking coffee as Monica serves him burger and fries. Monica, <laughs> I was wondering if uh, maybe we, uh, I mean, you and I could, uh, you know, get a, I, I mean, uh, have a, a date? Yeah. I get off work in 15 minutes. Walk me home? Sure. That was easy. On Furious, feeling a whole lot better. Just outside the diner, continuous, unknown point of view. From across the street, Furious's head is clearly visible in the brightly illuminated window of the diner. A disco boy stands in the shadows, gazing at the diner. He recognizes Furious. Exterior, waterfront, night. The convoy has pulled up alongside a rusty old freighter docked at the pier. Casanova's men throw the gate of the trunk open and the camera moves in. No one is there, but we notice two large lumps under the packing of blankets. Casanova holds Annabelle in his arms as they watch a large wooden crate being lowered from the deck of the freighter. Honey, our ships come in. Casanova's cellular phone rings outside the diner continuous. The disco boy is on his phone, his pistol is drawn, and he's got it aimed right on Furious's head. Just give me the word. Back to the pier, continuous on Casanova. Wait, I'll be right there. Where are you going? Head hunting. <laughs> A moment later, Casanova, two or three disco boys, drive off in one of the sedans as the crate is loaded onto the truck and the gate is pulled closed and locked. Inside the truck, a moment later. The engine starts up and the truck starts to move as invisible boy <laughs> and the spleen poke their head out from under the pack and blanket. They approach the crate and invisible boy shines his flashlight on it. The crate is secured with rivets and thick metal bands. There's no way they're going to be able to get inside of it. But in the light of the flashlight, they see faded red lettering in Russian and the distinctive old hammer and sickle of the former Soviet Union. Exterior, dimly lit street night. Furious walks Monica home. I admire you. Why? Being a superhero, wanting to save the world. It's so unselfish. Is it? It is? Most people just want to make money or be famous or something. But you risk everything just to help people. I wouldn't mind being famous. Who wouldn't? In the shadows behind them, Casanova follows, stalking them as a silent vampire. I've never been able to figure out what to do with my life, which is why I guess I'm still a waitress. Nothing wrong with being a waitress. What's your real name? Roy. Have you always lived here? He nods. Me too. 
I love this stupid old town. It's noisy, it's smelly, it's falling apart. Tom. Yeah. Casanova's point of view. Monica's smiling, looking lovely. Close on Casanova. He wants her. Back on Furious and Monica. I thought of leaving, going to Chicago or New York, but... What have they got that we ain't got? Champion's going to bounce back. And I want to be here when it does. Me too. You don't seem very angry right now. He shrugs and they kiss very tenderly. You know what? Underneath all that anger, I think there's just a little boy who wants everyone to love him. I just want to be a superhero. That's what I mean. Night, Roy. She turns and climbs the stairs of an old apartment building and goes inside as Furious watches feeling emotions he's not used to. He really likes her. He starts walking back down the street, past a man sitting on the stoop. The man looks up. It's Casanova Frankenstein. Going my way? Furious is caught completely by surprise. He takes a stand, ready to fight. Take it easy, take it easy. I just want to have a little chat. That was quite the number you did on my car. You've got a lot of violence in you. I like that in the guy. Furious, silent. You know what the difference is between good and evil, Roy? Furious reacts to the fact that Casanova knows his real name. Evil is more fun. When you want something, you just take it. If you, somebody gets in your way, you kill them. You seem like a very frustrated guy, Roy. Unhappy, unfulfilled. What is it you've always wanted? Always desire. Because whatever it is, I can give it to you. Fame? Easy. Fortune? Even easier. Women? <laughs> Easiest of them all. Close on Furious says, out of the corner of his eye, he catches movement in the alley across the street. He knows what it is. I'll let you lean on a little secret, Roy. In the Tuesdays, this entire city will belong to me. And there's not a damn thing your little pals can do about it. It's the perfect time to switch teams. So, what do you say? You're nuts. They always call the great ones nuts. And the nuts always call themselves great. Are you with me or against me? Against. Too bad. Plug him. Gunfire rings out from the alley as the disco boys step out, their pistols blazing, but Furious has anticipated them. He leaps right at Casanova, pins his arms in a bear hug, and holds him in the line of fire. Right! The disco boys stop firing. Furious drags Casanova back into the empty lot, using him as a shield. Thanks for reminding me which team I'm on. You're dead. So are you. Furious releases Casanova, then runs for it and leaps over the wooden wall at the end of the lot as the Disco Boys open fire again, and their bullets punch holes through the walls. Furious runs back down the street and escapes into the night. Exterior, the Frankenstein Center, continuous. The convoy drives up the hill towards an ominous looking structure that we've recognized from the model on the TV interview with Casanova earlier. A high central tower rises up out of the half-completed bulwarks of a future, featureless concrete. It looks both totally modern and completely ancient but a profound sense of evil connects to both themes beautifully. Angle on a plaque that reads, Frankenstein Center for the Performing and Non-Performing Arts. The gates of the center open and the convoy passes through. Inside the truck a moment later, invisible boy and the spleen stand listening, waiting as they feel the truck pull to a stop. A moment later, the gate is pulled open. Annabelle is there with several thuggy looking security guards. Be careful with my baby. There are two lumps under the packing blankets again. Exterior loading dock a few moments later. The crate is being carried away by a forklift, a beat, and then invisible boy in this plane slip out of the empty truck and run down the back, run down the road back toward the gates, which are still open. They're just about to pass safely through them when a pair of armed security guards step in their path, their guns pointed at them. Freeze. Hands up. They freeze. Their hands are held high. What are you two doing here? Our heroes are mute. 
Not talking, eh? That can be fixed. Turn around, start walking up the hill. And no bunny boots. Invisible boy and the spleen turn, hands in the air, and they start up the hill. The guards right behind them. Kid, pinch him. Invisible boy pinches his nostrils, and the spleen lets out with a horrendous fart. The guards gag and choke violently with the fumes as our heroes turn and run for it, escaping out the gate. Interior, Doc Heller's laboratory, barn. A little later, Invisible Boy and Spleen report to the others. Whoever was in that crate is from Russia. The others consider this and hear a familiar voice. Is there room in the pack for one more wolf? They look up and see that Furious has just returned. The Sphinx moves in. For a moment, they stand face to face. I was wrong. I need my friends. Sphinx takes off his mask, revealing that he is the bus boy from the Tacky Taco. Amigo. They embrace. A few minutes later, the others are gathered around Furious, listening to his story. Casanova said that in two days, the entire city will belong to him, and there wasn't a thing that we could do about it. What did he mean? Uh -huh. Through the windows, the moon is seen rising over the hillside, the Frankenstein center silhouette ominously against it. Raja, Shoveler, and Furious gaze at it. Maybe it's time we check that place out. But how do we get in? We just become like the wolf who wears the sheep's clothing. Montage with music the next day. Classic disco, stand up if we can get the rights. Furious, <laughs> <laughs> Raja, and the Shoveler in street clothes walk down the street together and step into the doorway of the Salvation Army thrift shop. Later, close on, three pairs of legs wearing polyester pants and vintage shoes, a la the classic shot from Saturday Night Fever. Camera widens to reveal our three heroes dressed in full-blown 70s attire with vintage sunglasses, doing their best travel to strut down the street. Music continues as our heroes strut their way through the gates of the art center, right past the security guards. Outside the center, day. They climb the long stairs towards the center, which looms above them, then pass through the big wooden doors and into interior, main hall, a moment later. End music. As our heroes move through a vast but empty main hall, a small army of heavily armed security guards marches about. So, where's the art? He hasn't stolen it yet. This place is built like a fortress. Because that's what it is. They hear a wild burst of drunken laughter echoing through the hall. What's that? Come on. They approach a doorway. The noise is coming from within. Interior banquet hall. A moment later, as our heroes step inside and see, a big luncheon is in progress. Casanova, Annabelle, and Tony P sit at the head table. The room is lined with banquet tables, which are filled with vicious-looking characters. Drunk, eating, laughing, and giving the waitress a very rough time. Oh, my God. Every crook in this city is here. On a group of vicious looking bald biker types. There's the boneheads from the south side. On three insidiously, insipidly, haha, <laughs> evil looking guys in hip suits. Those are the bland boys from downtown. On a dark haired white guy dressed as a rapper. Italian eyes. <laughs> what? <laughs> on, a, on a guy with a frightening assortment of metal things piercing his face. That's the, uh, the stapler. Yeah. <laughs> On two thugs dressed as Elvis. <gasps> the Elvis brothers. <laughs> A more degenerate group of criminals never sat down to lunch. Furious recognizes one of the waitresses. It's Monica. Casanova's got his eyes on her too, and he remembers her from the night before on the street with Furious. Aunt Annabelle noticing his interest. Our heroes see Monica walking straight towards them. They turn away, lean against the wall, trying to be totally inconspicuous. But as she passes them, not noticing them, Casanova approaches her. Excuse me. She stops, turns to him while our heroes listen in, only a few feet away. Monica. Beautiful name. This suits you. Close on furious. Getting jealous. I, I hope you won't take this the wrong way, but I couldn't help but notice. You're a dead ringer for Veronica Lake in the Blue Dahlia. Really? Furious growls. Raja gives him an elbow. Are you an actress? 
Just a waitress. <gasps> you underestimate yourself. Mr. Furious is fuming. The strands of his perfectly cuffed disco do start to stand straight up. You know, I am writing a play. It's just a little Broadway thing, but there's a part in it that I think you would be perfect for. Really? I love to hear you read it. Could you stick around after the luncheon? Sure, I guess. Terrific. She turns and walks into the kitchen, close on Casanova, watching her. His intentions are sinister. He turns and sees our heroes hanging by the wall. What are you three doing here? This is invited yes only. Out! Our heroes skulk out. Just outside the banquet hall, continuous, as our heroes step out and breathe a sigh of relief. That was too close. We gotta find out what's going on in there. Hey. Sirius has spotted a large covered dessert table waiting to be wheeled into the hall. Back in the banquet hall a few moments later, as the dessert table is wheeled in in a closer angle under the tablecloth, we see three pairs of disco shoes creeping along. A few minutes later, Monica steps up to the dessert table. Suddenly, she's yanked under. Under the table, continuous, Monica struggles, tries to cry out, but a hand is clamped firmly over her mouth. To me. She calms down and takes her his hand off of her mouth. What are you guys doing here? The waitress leaves. Uh, the big doors to the dining room are swung closed and the cigars are lit. The meeting has begun. Casanova takes the podium. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoy the cigars. I had to kill a dozen Cubans to get them. <laughs> 22 years ago, this town was yours. And I was your king. On the hood's listening board, puffing on their cigars, this is a sad old story. But they called me a psycho. And they put me away. For 20 years, I rotted in a cell, painting watercolors, writing haikus, just waiting for the day I could take my revenge. Well, brothers, that day has come. Our heroes under the table listening, Monica begins to realize what's going on. Back to Casanova. This was always crazy. Well... The joke's on them, because tonight, at precisely midnight, on the 12th anniversary of my tragic arrest, every man, woman, and child in this city is going to turn into a raving psychotic. Mothers will murder their tots. Old ladies will strangle their cats. Children will burn off their babysitters. The guest thinks Castanova's completely lost it. Italian ice speaks up. You're out of your mind. I beg your pardon? Nobody could drive a whole city crazy. Tell you what, Ice. I'll make you a friendly little wager. If I can't do it, you can blow my brains out. If I can, I blow out yours. Now the hood's interest has been perked. Done. <laughs> Honey, give the boys a taste. Annabelle puts on a pair of heavy-duty sound deadening ear protectors and presses a button on a small remote control device. Angle on a speaker placed above the podium as the air is suddenly filled with a weird, uh, horrific noise. Somewhere between the sound of a fire siren and a hornet trapped in your ear. Everyone in the room, except Annabelle, goes completely berserk. Camera pans the table as the guest laughs demonedly, punching, gogging. Uh, gouging? Yeah. Strangling and stabbing each other. <laughs> Under the serving table, our heroes go crazy. Casanova, in a state of psychotic ecstasy, whips out his pistol and empties it into the giant ice, who drops to the floor, dead. Annabelle presses the button again. The sound winds down and stops, and everything returns to normal. The entire event lasted only a few seconds, but the guests are dazzled. That was great. What the hell was that? How'd you do that? Casanova throws Annabelle a kiss. Tonight at midnight, that sound will be amplified across this entire city. Murder and mayhem will reign supreme. And Champion City will be ours again. This will be our castle. And I will be our king. And there's only no one. 
to stop us. Suddenly, a familiar voice is heard. Not so fast, Casanova. That was bloody perfect. A pair of curtains suddenly part, and Captain Amazing, look, looking a bit singed, is standing there in a classic superhero pose. Camera pans the crooks as their criminal ecstasy turns into instant terror. They yank out their pistols, dive cover under the table, throw their hands up in surrender, etc. But Casanova just grins. Don't worry, fellows. I killed him. And I had him stuffed. Casanova reaches behind Captain Amazing's back and pulls a string, like the ones they used to have on those old talking dolls. Is it my butt cute in these tights? <laughs> Blue is my color. <laughs> oh, my abs are killing me. <laughs> the on our heroes under the table stunned. On the Elvis brothers. The king is back. Along live the king. The uh -huh. cooks fire their pistols exuberantly into the air as disco music fills the air and Casanova dances, basking in their ad admiration. And our heroes slip for out from under the table and make a good make good on their escape. Interior Doc Keller's barn lab later. On our heroes and Monica, powwow, sobered by what they have seen. Oh, yeah. What could have made such a horrible noise? He's got the psycho stridulator. What? A what? What? Ten years ago, the Kremlin's top secret psychiatric warfare division developed the prototype for a weapon that emitted a fluctuating alternative frequency noise that produced a violent psychotic reaction in any mammal within hearing distance. But when this old Soviet Union fell, the stridulator and its brilliant inventor, Dr. Kopov, disappeared. This Kopov, what happened to him? Not him, her. They react to that piece of news and the bowler opens up the newspaper. Did she look like this? Close on a photo of Andal and Casanova announcing their wedding engagement. Silence. This is bad. Maybe it won't work? It works. A village in Siberia was wiped out when a cleaning woman switched it on by mistake. Another grim silence as they realize how desperate the situation is. For the first time, they're really scared. You've got to warn the city. Ow. No one will believe us. They'll think we're a bunch of weirdos. Camera cuts between them as they look at each other, their frightened faces, their sad, faded costumes. Even the Sphinx looks scared. We know what we gotta do. They look at him. We're outnumbered 20 to 1. Suicide. Maybe, but this isn't about living or dying. It's about good versus evil. And we're good, whether we like it or not. Maybe we look a little funny. On the screen. And smell a little funny. We're not bulletproof and we can't fly, but we're superheroes. And that means doing what's right, even when it's impossible. This is our city. To our friends, our family. And if we don't save them, nobody will. So I say we take a ride up that hill, blast our way in there, destroy that psycho whatchamabob, and teach these deviants a lesson they'll never forget. Now you're talking. Sounds good to me. Let's do it. And we'll take a bunch of them with us. They're all with him. Monica steps forward. I just want you guys to know, I may not be a superhero, but I'm with you, and I want to help. Oh, that's, that's oh thank you. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, Monica. <laughs> we really could use some coffee. And some sandwiches. With mustard. Sure. A few minutes later, Monica serves sandwiches and coffee as the hero plan. That place is huge, and we don't know where the psycho thing even is. <laughs> or even what it looks like. <laughs> you must have it hidden very well. Time to get lucky. On, oh, sorry, on Monica as she gets an idea. A moment later she slips a canned tornado into a purse as the others put their arms around each other in a group huddle and brace. Go do what you gotta do. We'll meet back here at sunset. Do or die. You will die. Do or die. Do or die. Victoria or Morty? 
heroic music as exterior auto demolition yard day, close angle on the front grill of the Herkimer Battle Jitney as Mr. Furious hooks it up to Sally's auto demolition tow truck. A moment later, he drives the tow, the tow truck towing off the lot. As Sally steps out of her office, pissed off, hey! <laughs> Exterior, Heller's Farm, day. On the sink, standing as immobile and silent as a statue, as a falling leaf slowly flutters in front of him. In a flash, his machete slices through the air and the leaf continues fluttering down, but in two pieces. Interior laboratory barn, day. Doc Heller fine tunes the shrinker spray as the bowler sits quietly in the hayloft, setting the old dog-eared photo of her father and herself as a little girl. Interior invisible boy room, day. Invisible boy stands in front of his mirror, eyes closed, concentrating for all he's worth, trying to become invisible. He suddenly pops his eyes open and looks at himself in the mirror, but he's still completely visible. He flops onto his bed in frustration. Interior diner, day. Clothes on the table full of food, eggplant parm, broccoli, chili, camera pulls back to reveal the spleen sitting alone in the booth, stuffing his face, gassing up for battle. Interior, the shoveler's house, day. The shoveler standing in his bedroom has just put on his freshly laundered suit. Camera opens wide to reveal Lucille, his wife, standing there holding his just polished shovel. He takes it from her and then takes her in his arms. Baby, if I don't make it. Find yourself a normal guy. You don't want a normal guy. And they kiss. A few minutes later in the living room, the shoveler's kids last sprawled out in the television. The shoveler in battle array steps into the room. He wants to say something to him, but the kids don't even take their eyes off the TV to look at him. He turns and walks out in silence. In music. Interior, the Raja dining room day. The shades are drawn. The Raja, in full cloth costume, quietly loads silverware into his secret pockets of his cape. Suddenly, the light switches on. It's his mother. She's caught him red-handed. Jeffrey, you thief! Bye-bye. It's not what you think. And why are you wearing that silly costume? Because... I must do what here, mother. Ah, his mother. Shocked. A British superhero. Mother, I'm sorry. I, I don't know how much you wanted me to be a, a doctor or a lawyer with a family, but it's just not who I am. But the silverware? I hurl it. Deadly accuracy. I use it to fight evil. Jeffrey, this is wonderful. It is? I always knew you were special. You did? Ever since you were a little boy. Come with me. Interior upstairs hallway a moment later. She pulls down the stairway to the attic. Interior the attic a moment later. She switches on the light and leads the Raja to a far corner where she moves a couple of old hat boxes, revealing an ancient leather-bound box with the word Excalibur engraved in gold on the top. This is for you. The Raja opens the box and registers astonishment as he sees. A fabulous Victorian silver set packed with formidable looking servers, cake knives, ice cream forks. Your great, great grandmother's wedding silver. The Raja lifts up and handles a large, heavily engraved pie server. Bitchin'. Exterior, outside Heller's barn lab evening. Clothes on, Mr. Furious, wrench in hand, covered with grease and oil, cussing to himself as he works under the hood of the Herkimer. Try it again. Invisible boy sitting behind the wheel tries the ignition of the Herkimer, and the old engine grinds as it turns over, but it doesn't catch. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. I said, come on! Mr. Furious slugs the engine with his fist, and it sputters and backfires into life, shaking, rattling, leaking, exploding, but running. Furious kisses the Herkimer as the buller calls out to him from the barn. Mon Capitan, it's for you. Hello. Exterior <laughs> no location evening clothes on Monica. It's me. Back to Furious, continuous. Monica, where are you? Back to Monica, wider angle, revealing that she is on a payphone just outside the art center. She's wearing makeup and a sexy little dress. She looks like she's dressed for a date. Disco boys and security guards are about to go, are, and security guards go about their business all around her. The Frankenstein Center. 
cut back and forth between them. Are you nuts? Get out of there! I'm going inside. What are you talking about? Listen, Casanova may be a supervillain, but he's got a weakness. And I'm it. Maybe, just maybe, I can trick him into showing me the location of the whatchamathingy. He's a psycho! He'll kill you! Just shut up and listen. Hold off on the attack as long as you can. If I can discover the location, I'll call you. And what if you get killed? Then at least I will have died trying, right? Very silent, taken aback by her courage. Roy, we might never see each other again. So I'd better tell you now. I think you're wonderful. What? Bye. Monica! Interior lobby of, Frank of the Frankenstein Center continuous as Monica approaches the guard standing by the main door. Did you tell Mr. Frankenstein that Monica is here? Sure, sure doll. Back to the barn continuous. Fury stands by the Herkimer phone. It's still in hand. He seems speechless, dazed. Something inside him has changed. Hey. You okay? Sure. Back to the Frankenstein Center a few minutes later. Casanova steps out and sees Monica, looking very sexy. Hi. I thought you chickened out on me. Just wanted to, um, powder my nose. His eyes roam all over her. He knows she's up to something, but she looks yummy. This is just the sort of cat and mouse game he loves. How about uh, giving me the tour? Why not? Exterior courtyard a few minutes later, as Casanova leads Monica across an open courtyard towards the sheer walls of the imposing central tower. Big, isn't it? <laughs> he leads her to a massive archway, <laughs> the only apparent entrance to the tower. But just as she's about to pass through, Monica looks up and sees something that makes her pull back with fear. Her point of view, a very sinister looking security eye, gazes down at her from the top of the archway. It's not very, it's not activated. They pass through into interior rim of the base tower continuous, which is filled with immense bronze sculptures of voluptuous, scantily clad females in various poses of bondage. Monica reacts, these things are scary. Who's the artist? Me. Exterior of the lab, far night. The bowler, spleen, invisible boy, and Doc Heller load up the Herkimer with Heller's weaponry. As Mr. Furious lies sprawled on the hillside, breathing in the night air, contemplating a dandelion gone to seed, and listening to the sounds of night, the Raja, Shoveler, and Sphinx stand nearby watching, trying to figure out what's wrong with him. A world fool is a, 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 a whippoorwill, is heard singing. Listen, he's lonely. And he doesn't care who knows it. Raja and the shoveler share a bewildered look. The bird sings again. We're all the same, really. Our songs, our dreams, our seeds are all just a brave attempt to live forever. He's in love. His anger is gone. Oh no. Great timing. Has Monica called? <laughs> Interior top of Frankenstein Tower continuous. Casanova leads Monica into um, palatial room, palatio, palatio, whatever. Palatial. Filled with priceless objects, dart all of which reflect Casanova's dark uh, psyche. Um, a Munch painting, Mayan idols, weird German furniture, a huge glass chandelier hovers over the room. A massive bronze sculpture of a wolf, Don, in the same style as the other sculpture, is perched on the balcony. It seems to be howling out over the city, which is seen in a spectacular view, spread along the shore below. This is where I come to be alone. He turns down the light and quietly closes the locks on the big door to the room, close on Monica, sensing her danger. Oh, look at the view. She moves out onto the balcony as Casanova slips the gold chain from around his neck and follows her. Interior, barn, lab, continuous. Our heroes have gathered around Furious, who sits in a chair, getting a, the third degree. Nap out of it. Get on to yourself. Get mad. I just don't feel it. Uh, he's turned into a completely normal person. 
that. <laughs> normal? What's normal? Does normal exist? And if it did, how would we know it? Yeah. Shever, or slung been sending and sprawling. You know, Eddie, that was really uncalled for. <laughs> Exterior balcony on Frankenstein Tower on Monica, gazing out onto the city as she senses Casanova slinking up behind her. I'm chilly. She turns, elegantly avoiding him and moving back inside. Back to the barn lab continuous. Blaine holds up Furious's favorite sunglasses. Look, your favorite sunglasses! Your Roy Rogers coffee mug! Your Spider-Man Pez dispenser! Okay, you win. I'm pissed off. I'm, I'm, I'm seriously peeved. <sighs> Back at the Frankenstein Tower continuous, Monica moves nervously around the room as Casanova sprawls, ling uh, sprawls out on the bed, toying with his gold chain. Come here. I'm not that kind of girl. So why are you here? Curiosity. Remember the cat. <laughs> Suddenly he hears high heels in the hall. A key is put into the lock. Casanova leaps off the bed, grabs Monica, and roughly shoves her into the closet. He leaps back onto the bed. Just as the door opens, and Annabelle, dressed in a lab coat and wearing high heels, enters. Casanova is completely relaxed, nonchalant. What are you doing all alone in the dark? Uh, fantasizing about you. She crosses the room to the wolf culture. I thought you were done. One last tweak. She opens a secret panel on its back, revealing a flashing high-tech interior. And Monica, watching from the closet, realizes that she's found the... No, that's not it. The psycho stridulator. stridulator? Back to the barn lab continues, close on, a boombox, a CD jacket, tells us that Kenny G is playing. If this doesn't do it, nothing will. On Furious, a pair of headphones on his head, the music is so loud that we can hear it even though it's being played only through headphones. On the others, gathered around him waiting to see if it will work. And then Furious begins to respond as his face turns into a contorted grin. It's working. Furious groans. And the others are thrilled. They've done it. Music is just, it's so beautiful. He starts to weep. The <laughs> others give a collective groan of defeat. <sighs> Back at the Frankenstein Tower continuous. As Annabelle works on the psycho stridulator, Monica looks at the clock, which reads almost 11. Time is running out. Back to the barn lab, close on the shoveler's wristwatch, which also reads 11. Shoveler and Raja. It's time. With or without, we've got to go. Back to the Frankenstein Tower, as Annabelle closes up the wolf and starts to leave. Our guests are waiting. I'll be down in a jiffy. She goes out, Casanova as the sound, Casanova listens as the sound of high heels fades away, and then he goes to the closet and lets Monica out. I'd better go. Spy. What? I saw you, walking home. Who? Yes. Roy. She makes a sudden try for the door, but he blocks her way. A cold look in his eye that makes her step back in fear. Don't be afraid. I never hit a lady. He lets the gold chain drop loose in his hand and starts coming to her, a sadistic grin on his face. This is the real Casanova. Monica pulls back, then reaches into her purse and takes out a canned tornado, which she holds out threateningly. Stay away. Oh, you're right. Can me? <laughs> he laughs dementedly. As Monica pops open the can, a swirling funnel of air shoots out of it and engulfs Casanova, throwing him across the room. Monica grabs a handset of a headset, handset of a cordless phone and runs out the door on Casanova, pulling himself together. That bitch! Interior just outside continuous. As Monica runs for it, dialing the phone on the fly. Interior. Timbon, continuous on the phone, ringing, but no one else is there. Exterior, the barn, continuous. Our heroes are climbing into the Herkimer, whose noise, noisy idling engine obliterates the ringing of the phone. She still might call. Are you calling or not? I'll drive. Not a chance. He shoves them back, closing the heavy steel door behind him. Back to the Frankenstein Tower, continuous on Monica. 
hiding behind a large planter, listening to the phone ringing on the other end. Come on, guys, pick up. Suddenly, we hear Casanova's voice on the line. That's Samantha. Back in the tower room, continuous, Casanova is listening in on the other phone. Nobody home. Back to Monica, continuous, as she moves quietly down the hall. Inside the Herkimer, continuous, the shoveler is at the wheel. The Raja sits in the passenger seat. The others are in the back. Here we go. He forces a stick into gear and the Herkimer lurches forward. You got liftoff. May the forks be with us. <laughs> Exterior, the Todd Keller's house continues as the Herkimer backfiring, smoking, clanging rubbles down the driveway into action. Back in the Herkimer continuous. Shoveler tries to put the car into second gear, but it won't go. He yanks and pulls and struggles until, until the stick comes off in his hand. First is good. <laughs> Interior corridor and Frankenstein Tower continuous. Casanova instructs three security guards. Ivanter alive. Yes, Mr. Frankenstein. Camera pans up to the top of the staircase where Monica is crouched listening. Exterior, streets of Champion City, night. Various shots as the Herkimer rumbles and smokes down the Champion's main street in first gear. And citizens step out of the house and bars to watch this bizarre sight on a little boy and his father. Daddy, what is that thing? I don't know, son. A couple of grizzly characters stand behind in front of a bar. The Herkimer? Those yuppies was driving anything. Inside the Herkimer, continuous, on a furious and the others in the back. Eagle, we need you. Just got mad. <laughs> furious closes his eyes and tries, but it's hopeless. <gasps> Interior. Interior VIP lounge and Frankenstein's tower continuous. Uh, <clears throat> a a hotel-like lounge. Annabelle is holding court with all the top crooks from the luncheon, charming the pants off them. Casanova slithers up behind her. Alice, this woman without whom I would have gone sane. Exterior front gate of Frankenstein tower continuous. A pair of security guards, the same two who got gassed by the spleen, are on duty when they see a strange looking vehicle chugging up the hill straight for them. The hell is that? Looks like a Ford dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> and then they hold up their hands for it to stop, but the Herkimer just rolls past them, hitting the iron gates and snapping them open as if they were made of matchsticks. Hey! hey! They open fire. Inside the Herkimer, continuous. Bullets are heard pinging off the Herk as as through the windshield just ahead, we see the long stairway heading up to the front door of the art center. Hang on. Exterior of the stairs continuous. Several more guards open fire as the Herkimer hits the stairs and starts bouncing up them. Back at the lounge on Casanova checking his watch. It's short time. But then they all hear the sound of gunfire. What's that? Back on the stairs continuous. As the Herkimer chugs and bounces towards the entrance of the center, Inside the Herkimer continuous. Our heroes get bounced all over the place. Interior, just inside the center, continuous. As the guards close and bolt the big wooden doors of the art center. On a guard wearing a headset. Mr. Frankenstein, we're being attacked. Interior, security desk, con continuous. Casanova sits at the security console. Annabelle, Tony P, and the top crook stand behind them, listening. I whom? We don't know. Back on the stairs, continuous, as the Herkimer climbs to the top, then rams into the doors with a thud. But the do doors hold. Back on the villains. And they'll never get through those doors. Back at the front door, continuous. But the plucky little Herkimer digs its rear wheels and pushes against the doors like the little engine that could. Inside the Herkimer, continuous, as our heroes encourage the Herk. Come on, baby. Do it, big boy. On its wheels grinding, chewing up the concrete. Just inside the center, continuous, as the Herkimer comes crutching through the big wooden doors of the center, scattering the guards. Back inside the Herkimer, continuous, our heroes cheer, pass the Herk. a girl. Boy. Taxi Casanova, watching on a security monitor. Mr. Frankenstein, they're in. The kiss him. Back in the hall, continuous, 
The Hergamer drives into the main hall of the center as a small army of security guards swarm in, guns blazing. Back at the security desk, continuous. Casanova and the crooks watch the security monitor. Inside the Hergamer, continuous. The bullets sound like hailstones bouncing off the armor of the Herc as our heroes grimly prepare themselves for battle. The Sphinx put his mask. Put on his put on his mask. The bowler unzips her bag. Doc Heller cocks his air cannon. Spleen and Invisible Boy load a bag with canned tornadoes while Mr. Furious watches anxiously. The shoveler drives intently, bullets splattering like bugs on a windshield. Where am I going? Uh, through that. Right. But suddenly something under the hood blows up. The engine gives a loud groan and the Herkimer rolls to a dead stop. Inside, outside the Herkimer. Continuous. Right in the middle, in the most exposed position of the main hall, more guards around arrive and open fire. An armored golf cart with a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on it, speeding into the hall, blasting the Herc. Inside, the sound of big bullets is deafening as the shoveler tries to restart the engine. No good. She's dead. On Casanova and the crooks, watching the monitor and laughing as bullets pulverize the Herc. <laughs> Spam in a can! <laughs> But suddenly, the Herkimer's doors is thrown open, revealing our heroes, holding down Doc Heller, his air cannon at the ready. He fires. There's a whoosh of air, and the mounted gun and a dozen guards are sent thump, tumbling. Security desk continuous on Casanova and the others, watching, sobered. Back in the main hall continuous, as our heroes come charging out of the Herkimer, using their various skills to blow through the surprise guards, Mr. Furious comes out last, not quite sure what to do with himself, but suddenly a withering barrage of machine gun fire is being laid down on them by three guards firing Tommy guns from a balcony overlooking the floor. Bullets splatter all around them and several unlucky guards are hit, but our heroes die for cover. The Raja tries to get off of, tries to get out of fork, but the firing is too intense. Our heroes are pinned down. On Mr. Furious, as he sees the bag of canned tornadoes, He's got no superpowers, and he's scared to death, but he grabs a canned tornado. Recovery! With what? Bullets dancing all around him. Furious runs a desperate, but impressive, zigzag pattern on the floor. He performs a wild somersault, comes up to his feet, pops open the can, and executes a perfect jump shot, lobbying it up to the balcony. The tornado funnels out, and the guards are sent flying. On Casanova and the top crooks watching. Oh, mama, who are those guys? close on Casanova, who knows who they are. While back in the hall, our hero, heroes rally around a Mr. Chicken Furious. Not bad for a normal guy. Amigos! Do or die! Do or die! Exterior, courtyard a moment later. And go on, the security guy, I, watching as the panicking security guards retreat under the main tower. Back to Casanova, as he types something into the security computer. On the screen, a computerized image of the eye appears. Casanova highlights the word activate and then presses enter. Back to the courtyard on the eye as it comes to glowing sinister life. A hapless guard retreats under the arc. The eye instantly focuses on him and he is hit by a dozen nasty looking laser beams that sizzle him. A moment later, our heroes arrive at the arc. Furious is about to run through, but Doc Heller holds him back. Wait, look. He points to the man-shaped pile of charcoal. All that remains is the unfortunate guard. <laughs> Laser eye, and it's a humdinger. No problem. <laughs> the Raja takes out a butter knife, aims, and hurls it straight to the eye, but laser beams intercept the knife and instantly melt it. A formless blob of silver. Back to Casanova and the top crooks. We'll take care of these clowns. Uh-huh, a piece of cake. No sweat! Or corridor a moment later. As Tony P, the top crook, and the disco boys um, march towards the camera, they are an ugly, formidable looking bunch. Exterior, courtyard, continuous. Our heroes are blocked by the eye. Doc, there's got to be a way. But the doc is dying. Suddenly, they hear a woman's voice calling down to them. It's up here. It's up here. Monica. Exterior, top of Frankenstein Tower, continuous. Monica leans over the edge of the balcony, uh, the, the wolf sculpture looming over her, shouting down at them. Roy, the psycho thing is... But strong hands suddenly grab her. It's Casanova. Back to Furious Continuous. 
As high above, he hears Monica scream. Back to the balcony, continuous. Casanova held tightly across Monica's mouth, shouts down, taunting to Furious. Casanova is taunting Furious. Thanks, Roy. She's just my type. You can have her back when I'm done. Back to Furious, continuous. As he hears Casanova's evil laugh and Monica's scream, he is desperate to find a way up, but the wall is completely sheer. He feels helpless, frantic, near tears. Flash two, the terrified boy trapped in the back of his parents' car, crying, pounding on the windows. And then Mr. Furious's hands clench into fists. His hair stands up. His face turns into a mask of primordial rage. His button has finally been pressed. He's mad. He reaches up as high as he, high as he can close on his hand. His fingers literally dig into the concrete of the wall and he pulls himself up. Back at the top of the tower, continuous. Casanova throws Monica onto the bed, puts his hands on her throat and strangles her as she thrashes helplessly against his immense strength. Back to Furious. 50 feet up and climbing, he pulls himself up one hand, then another, digging in his fingernails, catching his toes on whatever tiny cracks he can find as the other stays up beside him. He'll never make it. Think positive. Meanwhile, invisible boy staring at the security eye, a look of fierce determination on his face. This is his moment. I can do it. He takes a deep breath, closes his eyes and concentrates. On Furious, as the fingers of one hand lose their grip and a toe hold gives away, for a desperate moment, Furious is dangling off the wall by the tips of his fingers of one hand. Only his incredible rage keeps his fingertips taut. Suddenly, there is a flash of silver and a large cake fork embeds into the concrete not far from his head. Furious grabs hold of it and throws a grateful look on at Raja, who slams up at him. Uh, as Invisible Boy, closed in concentration, walks very slowly, hands at his side, in an almost Egyptian pose toward the eye, which stares down merci mercilessly, waiting for its next victim, we notice that the Invisible Boy has become just slightly transparent. At the top of the tower, continuous on Casanova. A look of pleasure on his face as he strangles Monica. Her resistance fades, her hands fall away. She is pale, beautiful, almost gone, a picture of exquisite death. Some girls just know how to die. Suddenly, we hear someone cursing Casanova in Russian. He turns and sees Annabelle standing there, pistol in hand. You two-timing psychotic bastard! Darling, you've got the wrong idea. Do I? I, uh, I was only strangling her. I've, I've killed hundreds of women. It doesn't mean a thing. Poochie, you're overreacting. This is our night. It's what we've lied for, cheated for, murdered for. She's just a placing, a trifle. You're the only woman who's ever meant anything to me. I adore you, worship you. I want to make you my bride. He succumbs to his charms and he gently takes the pistol out of her hand. This is just one thing. I don't need you anymore. A look of terror comes across her face as she sees the murder in his eyes. Don't worry, darling. I never hit a lady. Exterior on the wall, a moment later, on Furious, still climbing as he hears a scream, looks up and sees Annabelle go plummeting past him. On our heroes, down below. Heads up! Camera holds on our heroes, wincing as Annabelle hits with an ugly thud. Suddenly, they hear Invisible Boy calling to him. Guys, I did it! I did it! I'm invisible! They all turn and see Invisible Boy. To can you see me? Yes. 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 Nuts! Here, turn that thing off. Invisible boy turns and sees a computer screen built into the wall. The same image uh, of the eye that was on Casanova's computer, but he doesn't have a clue how to turn, her, turn it off. Suddenly he hears uh, running feet, turns and sees the top crook and the disco boys rushing towards him through the giant sculptures. He gets an idea and sees right in front of the computer screen. Hey, creeps! He makes a face at him, and a dozen guns are instantly fired at him. 
He jumps clear behind the pillar as the bullets smash into the wall, one of them demolishing the computer screen. Close on the eye, he goes dead. On the invisible boy, hiding the pillar, hiding behind the pillar, he realizing he's been shot in the shoulder. Back on our heroes. This is it. Do or die. Bristling with pistols as our heroes, led by the Sphinx, Shoveler, and Buller, come running through the arc. Arch. The threesome. <laughs> <laughs> Go shoulder to shoulder with our heroes right behind them as the villains open fire, laying down a deadly. Uh, well, yeah. mm -hmm. On shoveler, bowler, and sphinx standing together, deflecting their bullets with with a shovel, bowling ball, and machete, as they practice with pebbles on the farm with the raj right behind them, hurling silverware. On the villains, rapid firing, but their bullets ricochet back onto them, dropping them. They start to fall back, back to the top of the tower, continuous. Casanova is about to finish Monica. And the light goes out. Frankenstein. Casanova turns and sees Furious standing on the balcony. Roy, what took you so long? Furious starts at Casanova, who aims Annabelle's pistol at him. Furious hesitates. Let me guess. Bullets don't hurt you. <laughs> But they don't stop me. Furious lunges at Casanova, who gets off his shot before Furious grabs the gun out of his hand. Casanova ducks clear. Furious tosses the pistol away, then realizes he's bleeding from a shoulder wound. Smart, doesn't it? Shall we dance? He turns on his stereo, then sound of disco music fills the air. Intercut between the two fights continuous. Downstairs, the villains have regrouped. Let's wash them! And they charge and mass at the hair at our heroes who are waiting for them, pinching their noses closed, the spleen bent over on their forefront, while Casanova dances around Furious like a cat. Furious fighting the pain of his bullet wound, lunges at him, and Casanova neatly sidesteps them. The crooks and disco boys fall back, gasping, choking at the nauseous flames, fumes. As Casanova attacks. Advancing shoulder to shoulder, fighting as a team, our heroes wield machete, fork, shovel, bowling ball, and a can tornado, forcing the villains back. Casanova comes at Furious relentlessly, kicking and spinning, and Furious gets the worst of it. Suddenly, a squad of disco boys come charging at our heroes from the flank, but Doc Heller turns to face them. Shrinker spray held Rambo-style on his hips. He lets them have it, blasting them with a dense blue spray. When the spray clears, the D-Boys lie squirming on the floor. Prisoners is now their child-sized disco suit. Help! Get me out of this! Ah! Ah! <laughs> Upstairs, Casanova pummels Furious, while downstairs, the shoveler dispatches the Elvis brothers with some nifty shovel work. Then, but suddenly, the Bland Boys, pistols blazing, are advancing on him, forcing him back against the base of the sculpture. But the Raja suddenly leaps up onto the sculpture. Gentlemen. The Bland boys look up and see the Raja, both hands filled with silverware, which he hurls. A beat later, the Bland boys, bristling with forks and great food spoons, run screaming through the sculpture as Tony P, pistol in hand, skulks from out behind the sculpture and spots the bowler. Upstairs, Furious goes flying against a wall. Roy, you're making this too easy. As Tony takes a careful bead on the bowler. Say hello to daddy for me. He opens fire, but she instantly goes to, into her ball swing in frenzy. He fires missing. She's too fast to keep a beat on him. Finally, his gun clink, clicks empty. She turns and faces him. Daddy says hello. She hurls the ball at him like a fiery softball pitch. Ball's point of view, going straight for Tony P's screaming head. Ah! <laughs> on the bowler watching as Tony's scream is cut short by a gruesome thud. Back upstairs, Casanova comes at Furious again, but Furious ducks the kick, pops back up, and smashes Casanova's good arm, sending him on across the room. Casanova recovers. Let's change the tool. He rushes into his pocket and takes out a remote device that Annabelle used at the luncheon. He presses the button. On the wolf sculpture, as the jaws open, its eyes glow red, and the dreadful sound of the cycle stridulator grinds up and fills the night air like a siren. Downstairs, the foul noise fills the room, and our heroes, the villains, all go into full-blown psychotic episodes. The villains start shooting and stabbing each other. A series of shots around the city, continuous. 
on Main Street, cars slam into each other. Pedestrians start screaming and fighting. A man and his dog snarl and snap at each other. The customers at the Lakeside Diner go insane, hurling plates and food. At the shoveler's house, the kids turn psycho in front of the television, angle on a typical suburban neighborhood, as the sounds of screaming and smashing dishes and furniture can be heard from all the houses. Long angle of Champion City, as a den of collective insanity rises up from the city. Back to the top of the tower, continuous on Casanova in a full psychotic ecstasy. What a rush! On Monica, still motionless on the bed. Casanova and Furious collide in the center of the room and grapple in a contest of psychotically enhanced superhuman strength. Casanova gets his hands around Furious's throat and crushes it. Furious drops to his knees and Casanova thinks he's got him, but Furious, grimacing with rage, looks right him, him looks at him right in the eye. That all you got? Furious grabs Casanova's wrist and crushes him. Casanova howls with pain, loosens his grip. Furious slugs him again and again, and then he grabs Casanova by the belt, swings him around, and hurls him into the air. Casanova crashes into a huge crystal chandelier. There's an explosion of crystal and glass. Furious adverts his eyes as cut glass rains down all over him, and then he looks up and sees Casanova's gold chain has hooked onto a fixture of the chandelier. Casanova kicks and flails as he is hanged by the neck on his, old go on his own gold chain. Furious moves to the wolf sculpture. He plunges his hand through the bronze casing and rips out the heart of the psychostrigulator, a flashing football-sized device that gives off an unamplified but higher-pitched and more irritating sound. Furious hurls the device hard against the floor and it smashes into a thousand pieces. Close on one of the pieces, an insect-sized device that gives off an even higher-pitched, even more disorienting sound that is a very nerve center. That is the very nerve center of the psychostridulator. Furious lifts his foot and crushes it hard under his heel. Silence. Furious drops to his knees, wounded, exhausted. He looks up at Casanova, who dangles lifelessly at the chandelier. It's dancing with you. A series of shots, various locations, continuous. As our other heroes return to their senses amidst the vanquished crook, the traumatized remnants of whom run for it, things also return to normal on the street, at the Lake Short Lakeside Diner, and at the Shoveler's house. Back to the top of the tower, continuous. Furious moves to the bed where Monica lies motionless and pale. Monica. He touches her face, her eyes open, and she looks at him. You're beautiful when you're angry. He takes her tenderly in his arms. As the Raja, the Shoveler, and the others rush into the room and see, Furious and Monica embracing. Exterior, outside the Frankenstein Center, a little later. Police cars and news vans arrive as our heroes, battered, wounded, but victorious, walk proudly down the long stairs. Furious and Monica hold each other up. Wounded, invisible boy has his arms around the spleen, while policemen and the news people run up the stairs past them into the center, ignoring them as always. But this time, our heroes could care less. They know they are superheroes, and they don't give a damn who knows it. Interior, the Raja House, night. As the Raja opens the door and enters. Mother. She is there, waiting up for him. I'm home. They embrace. Interior, Shoveler's house, Nike, close on the TV screen. Don Stouffer is reporting. Few details have emerged. On the Shoveler's kids on the couch, still rattled by their psychotic episode glued to the TV. But the Dawn Patrol got this exclusive interview with two of the suspects. On the TV, Don Wong interviews the battered, handcuffed Elvis brothers as they are led away. I don't know who those guys were, but I never want to see them again. Sorry, cat. Uh, especially that uh, big dude with the shovel. Uh, 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 he was the worst. On the kids' collective reaction as they realize who it was, and then they hear the front porch door open. The front door open. In the front hall, the shoveler enters wearily. His shoulder hurts. His back is killing him as his kids come running towards him. Dad! 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 Are you okay? Dad. You hurt? Dad! I'm okay. I'm all right. Lean on me, Dad. I'll hold your shovel, Dad. They leaned him back into the living room and gave him a proud spot on the couch. You want a soda, Dad? Okay. 
He turns to get it as Eddie Jr. slides a footstool under his feet and Tracy puts a pillow behind his head. Rowan, the little one, cuddles up next to him, puts his arms around him. Nice work, Dad. Thanks, Rowan. You really are a superhero, aren't you? The shoveler nods. A few minutes later, the shoveler sits on the couch, feet up, soda in hand. The television is off. His kids all huddled around him, hanging on his every word. And that's when the engine blew up. Oh. oh. Whoa. What did you do? Well. On Lucille, as she comes in and sees her husband surrounded by his kids, a happy man at last. Exterior, Lakeside Diner. The next night, establishing. Interior, the diner, continuous on the spleen. Sitting between the bowler and the bandaged invisible boy, the bowler has her arm chummingly around the spleen's shoulder. The spleen finally has real friends. Doc Heller discusses the art of fork throwing with the Raja as the shoveler listens in. The sink sits at the end of the table, silent. So you're never actually conscious of range or trajectory. <laughs> Heck no. I just, you know, chuck them. Monica, in her waitress outfit, sits close to a bandaged Mr. Furious. On the TV, Don Juan reports. It's been 24 hours since the deadly psych psychosonic attack and the bloody shout out to left, bloody shootout that left Casanova Frankenstein and the dozens of the city's top with them dead. But tonight the question remains, who were these heroic mystery men who saved our city? On our heroes. Could have been anybody. <laughs> Wait a minute. And if that's it. That's our name. We are the mystery men. They all like it, except for the bowler. Hey, do I look like a man? Well, we can't call ourselves the mystery people. Mystery, mystery man. <laughs> I want to be a mystery man. <laughs> Eat your mustard. It doesn't matter what we call ourselves. We know who we are. Yes, Obi-Wan. Hey, he's gone. The other C. The Sphinx chair is empty. Roger spots a crumbled napkin on the table, opens it up, and reads. Until you need me again. Adios. <laughs> Silence. Reactions from our heroes as they realize that the Sphinx is gone. I miss him already. Suddenly, somewhere in the night, a burst of gunfire and screams are heard. The final music begins. Amigos. Duty calls. Their mystery men wolf their burgers and stand and start for the street. As Monica watches them leave, a patron asks her. Ma'am, who are those guys? I don't know. Just outside the diner a moment later, heroic group shot as the mystery men march down the middle of the street toward the sound of gunfire and into the night. Steam and credit, the end. Oh. Awesome. Y'all, oh, yeah. that was amazing. We'll see you back here at the next recording.